Welcome to the Barcode Podcast. My name is Ben Ponder and I'm your host and I'm really excited to have Scott Jensen of Rhythm Superfoods with us today. And I wanna remind everybody that the Barcode Podcast is brought to you by Titanium CPG Insurance. Titanium protects forward-thinking consumer brands with a range of insurance products and risk management services designed specifically for natural and organic food and beverage companies. You can learn more online at titaniumcpg.com. Scott Jensen, welcome. Glad to have you here, man. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, so we Scott is uh, a treasure trove of knowledge, wisdom, hard-earned uh, years in the trenches, years in the C-suite, and so we're going to try to cover a lot of ground with, with, with you today. But before we uh, get started, uh, take us to your favorite meal. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to pick one specific one, but there were probably a dozen of them that all centered around a gentleman named uh, Chef Paul Prudhomme from Louisiana. Very famous, yeah. Famous chef, PBS series, multiple years, 20 mm -hmm. cookbooks, uh, Stubbs Barbecue Sauce Company. Uh, I met him for the first time there. We started using his company to blend spices for us that we use in our marinades and barbecue sauces. Right. Um, in getting to know him and his team, got to really hang out with him, not only at his, at his test kitchens, but also when we were at trade shows, he would mm -hmm. invite us to dinners. Um, so with a and power- he probably had pretty good taste. Yeah, po powerful yeah. chef like that. Yeah. We're, we're going to another chef-centric restaurant and yeah. went to many of them with him. Mm -hmm. And you get some real special behavior from the, the staff and the chef when the, you the arrive The true Chef red carpet uh, yeah. treatment, yeah. So here in Austin, we'll just give one example right. in case there's some people that have been there, but Fonda San Miguel was uh -huh. one of the places we went to. Yeah, it's a very famous uh, interior Mexican, like high elevated cuisine. Beautiful stuff. And yeah. the chef and co-founder, uh, Miguel Rivago. Uh, so both Chef Paul Prudhomme and Miguel are both passed away by now, but... Um, that they were, you know, it was it was dueling thoughts and coming mm -hmm. together. She Chef mm -hmm. Paul Prudhomme was from kind of a Creole French background of, of Louisiana, New Orleans in particular, and uh, Miguel's coming from interior and, and Mexico City cuisine, bringing it mm -hmm. to Austin, and the amount of stuff that was off menu coming like every three minutes there was three or four new plates and and you know reaching across the table grabbing a bite of everything right there we must have had 20 or 30 different dishes yeah. um, we were we were there with a couple of people who had never eaten with chef paul too before and the, the sharing of the plates was important mm -hmm. but uh these two particular people including the husband was like i'd never seen that before and oh yeah yeah what the hell is going on that's here right, yeah. they're, they're uh -huh. taking you know a chicharroni off of my plate that's right yeah this is you're, you're violating my personal space yeah. here yeah so i got to, yeah i was loved working with him uh, everything i learned about uh french and creole and losing oh, sure. cooking was uh it was a benefit of hanging out with him as much as i got to do and the meals were, were, were the highlight of it all. Oh, that's magical. I, I, I suspect that something like that, you know, when you, when you have that sort of insider access is like, it's like getting a chance to watch Picasso paint, yeah. you know, like oh, you're yeah. just like, like somebody who just owns their craft. Yeah. And they, uh, they're just operating at another level. Yeah, like we all s struggle at home trying to figure out how we're going to cook something incredible. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to use the microwave and cook something incredible. There's certain basics that you have to learn how to do. And yeah. from someone coming from Louisiana, like a roux was really important. So several of his dishes are coming from a roux base with some sort of fat or butter that starts with and some flour to brown it. And that's the base of many meals. And if you've ever tried to do that, it's really easy to screw it up. Sure. Uh, but watching a master do it, he could do it on like a little bunsen burner with any right with his eyes them. closed yeah absolutely that's that's awesome that's a great that's a great context so um you know one of the things that i wanted to talk with you about we're, we're gonna just for our listeners who don't who don't understand the the breadth and depth of your background i do want to hit some of this stuff and then we can dive we'll, we'll take some deep dives along the way so mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how you found yourself initially in the consumer packaged goods space. Yeah, so um, the first advent of it was coming out of um, undergraduate uh, school in Dallas mm -hmm. at SMU. Right. I worked for an ad agency called the Bloom Agency, and I was lucky enough to work on several food companies. Carnation was one of them. Um, the uh, Rainbow Bread was another brand, mm -hmm. um, Kearns Nectars. And so I got that one side of, of, 
of the equation of, of a food company, which was the advertising side of it. Which I think is a pretty interesting thing about your background, because I think probably most people don't associate you as like starting your career as an as an ad agency guy, right? Like <laughs> yeah. that's that's really not like, you're sort of like an operator extraordinaire, but that's not how you started. In yeah, no, all. I mean, coming out of school, I just remember it was a great uh, salary of $16,500 a year. Oh man, you're, uh, you're a baller there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. it was tough, man, but I had already, I already had a car that was paid for, so mm-hmm. I could make things work. But you know, you scratch around and you learn a lot. And when I was there, I was there for around two years, a little over two years. I mm-hmm. uh, decided I wanted to go and get my MBA. I went to NYU and got my MBA up there. <clears throat> and that was all a path that kind of, in the back of my mind, was laid out nicely. From there, I'll go work for a larger consumer products company. I was lucky enough to get a job as a, an associate brand manager at James River Corporation, now International mm-hmm. Paper. So I was working on the marketing team for a couple of years there right. um, as uh, for, for Dixie Cups and Dixie Plates. That was the brands I worked on. Um, I missed Texas. I was living mm-hmm. in kind of the New York City area, just north and south South Connecticut. Right. Despite and the name Dixie, it was not Dixie. No, you were, it you were started there, Dixie. but I was yeah. up there. And, and That's right, yeah. Truth be told, I did have friendships up there. Yeah, yeah. But really had built and formed a strong friendship with a lot of people in Texas and missed it. Mm-hmm. Um but, but you didn't grow up in Texas. You went to school in Texas. Correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was an East Coast guy from right. Connecticut and Florida and back into New Hampshire boarding school in Massachusetts. Um, wanted to go somewhere warm, so looked in Florida and Texas and California and ended up right. going to SMU. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, I had two friends that I had met while I was going to NYU that um, I had met before, too, but um, they were both in New York City at the time, mm-hmm. displaced Texans as well, mm-hmm. originally from Lubbock, John and Eddie, mm-hmm. and uh, it was at that time that uh, we decided that we were going to start a barbecue sauce company. Stub, uh, the namesake that's on the bottle, um, uh, was close personal friends with John and his family, had moved from Lubbock. From, from the Lubbock area, yeah. yeah. And Eddie uh-huh. was from Lubbock, too. Mm-hmm. Had moved with all of his musician friends to Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. opened up a Stubbs barbecue here on I-35. Right. Um, and, <clears throat> and eventually closed it, or it closed. And he was kind of like trying to figure out what he was going to do next because he didn't, you know, there was no infrastructure of getting a, you know, million dollar loan to open a barbecue restaurant. And he was kind of a sole proprietor. So he'd called up and said, hey, man, I'm really, really needing to borrow some money. I think you guys could could help me out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were all like in New York scraping nickels and dimes together to get on the subway. Right. Um, But John led the effort and and Mm -hmm. pulled, I think it was like from all sources, like $1,400, sent it down to Stubb mm-hmm. so he could pay his rent at his house. And right. he was doing some catering at weddings and stuff like that. And and this was, he, he was known as Stubb. It was a C, C, CB, C. B. Christopher B. Stubblefield. Yeah, yeah, right. And um, we were like, oh, well, you know, we just saved, you know, a guy's foreclosure of his yeah. house rent or whatever <clears throat> it was. But about, <clears throat> about three months later, he shipped counter to counter, which you can't do anymore. Yeah. After 9-11, you can do it. But he shipped a cooler full of hot barbecue that he had pulled off the smoker that morning. Yeah. Uh, plus some bottles of barbecue sauce. Shipped it up to us and uh-huh. said, hey, um, go to LaGuardia. Uh, I've got a surprise for you guys for helping me out when I needed help. Yeah. And I think it was Eddie went in a yellow cab to LaGuardia. Right. Say, stay here. Went inside, picked up the boxes, brought it back. And we're like, this is incredible. This tastes incredible. It he took did. you back to Texas, too. Yeah. yeah. And so in the bottles of barbecue sauce, which he had made himself with his ingredients, poured it in hot, put it in old Jack Daniels bottles Mm -hmm. that he had pulled like a dozen of them from his friend Steve Wertheimer from the Continental Club on South Congress. Right. Had his friend Joe Ely, a famous musician, great Mm -hmm. musician too here in Austin, Mm -hmm. on his Mac 1 computer, Mac 2 computer, whatever it was designed the label and had some printed up at like Kinko's before FedEx bought Kinko's. That's right, yeah. And cut them out and put them on the bottle. And that became this bottle that we opened up and we're like, oh my God, this is the most delicious sauce I've ever had. Yeah. And that was when we all started going, oh, this is fun living up here and working for a big company Mm -hmm. and our careers are going great, but let's start a barbecue sauce company. Yeah. So that's what we did. We started writing the business plan, which we didn't even know how to write a business plan. Right. Now that was back when people wrote business plans yeah. for things. Right. Yeah. But and you were doing your textbook thing. You learned you learned in business school at Stern and yep. yeah. Uh-huh. And then 
you know, worked for a couple of years in the marketing side mm-hmm. of a consumer products company. I just remember a, a, a catalyst of, of change. You make that change, you go down and you're like, oh, the budget you used to have versus the budget you have. Um, Take our, a few zeros off. Our first year of revenue at Stubbs Barbecue was something in the vicinity of like 23 or 24, $25,000. And every one of those cases was UPS. Like it was a box with styrofoam driven 14 miles to the UPS station dropped off. And that's a lot of oh, stuff. Yeah. I just remember a small little print run of sales material for mm-hmm. the Dixie three ounce bath cup. I spent like fifty thousand dollars on. That's right. Yeah. Those. So it was like just it's, the scale is is apples and oranges. Yeah. Absolutely. But you, you know, that you just kind of did. You didn't think about it. In this case, you probably, you know, were you, you were counting every penny of those, you know, the, the and you knew where each one of those UPS shipments had gone too. Exactly. Uh, and you know first year or two, it's really specialty stores and right. you're trying to figure out even how to get into supermarkets. You go and talk to the people and they're like, well, you know, what's your marketing plan and what's your Super mm-hmm. Bowl advertisement plan and summer marketing? We're like- And you're just winging it. Yeah, we're yeah. just trying to make payroll next That's week. That's right. <laughs> were you, do you feel like at that point in your life, because you were, you, you know, you, you were, you're still young, but you had some formal training. Did you have what you would describe now as a channel strategy at that point? No, not at yeah. all. We, we thought we could do it all for sure. Yeah. And <clears throat> there was no one and no infrastructure. There were no podcasts. There were no accelerators. There was mm-hmm. no... The, the fancy food shows were really the only food shows back then. Right, there were yeah. no expos east and west. And if whenever they started, there were you know 50 booths at those shows at then. They're just tiny. <clears throat> yeah. So the infrastructure of knowledge was not there. There was right. no people the teacher or tell you what to do is really just not taking no for an answer, trying mm-hmm. to figure it out and learn. And that's a long learning process. So yeah. if there's not like the academia that there is now available, online podcasts, mm-hmm. accelerators, you go to Expo West or the Fancy Food Shows, they have all kinds of educators there. And right. they will teach you two years worth of brick walls to jump over in like a two hour period of time. Right, right. But it didn't exist back then. Mm-hmm. So we had to act like we were a big company, but we only had an incredibly small amount of money to spend. Right. So when did you guys move from, from New York City back to to Austin. I'm horrible at years, but let's call it 25 years ago. Okay. Um, the actual year date. Right. That's fine. Yeah. So 25 years ago, <laughs> Did, was there a was there some like demarcation point where you said this is this is legit enough that we should probably now quit our jobs and move? <laughs> yeah. So the first uh, six or nine months of it, we were still in New York. Mm-hmm. Stubb was down here. We had set him up. Uh, in, in a small little commercial kitchen mm-hmm. um, right across from the post office across Ben White Boulevard. It's an old shacky kind of place. Uh-huh. And so he was going to, to HEB, the major retailer at the right. time here and still here at the time, uh, and buying all of the ingredients at retail prices right. and putting them in like a 40-gallon bucket and stirring it. So and your then, margins were not incredible. Oh, they were so upside down. So you're That's buying right. it retail mm-hmm. and then selling it at wholesale. Right. Uh, right. So six ounce cans of tomato paste that he's hand, hand opening, cranking yeah. it, yeah, that going through. And at that point, you know that that part of uh, Ben White South Congress, not a nice, shady. Not, not a nice part of pretty town shady. at that point. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. but uh, truth be told, it was like uh, it was romantic, right? Sure. We're like, yeah, Stubb, this incredible barbecue legend, yeah. is making barbecue sauce. Mm-hmm. He's shipping it in a pallet up mm-hmm. to us, and we're getting forty cases of it. Uh-huh. We're, we're literally picking up a pallet case by case with a yellow cab and bringing it to some expensive storage place. Right. And going to a Balducci's, which was mm-hmm. big then and right. had still, one store still or two yeah. stores or whatever it was. Yeah. And when, when the buyer there it's said yes. a super yes, high-end uh, grocery store. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, when that buyer said yes and bought four cases, uh-huh. it was like, all right, we can't turn back now. Yeah. yeah. Four cases. <laughs> That's so. right. Uh, we made a promise. Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, we even, can make as much as you need. I don't yeah. even think... Like we may not have even cashed that check. It was one that we had to frame when they finally paid us. It was like, this is awesome. That's right. Yeah. It's the beginning of the business. So yeah. It sounds like I'm romanticizing it, but it is hundred percent accurate to exactly what we were doing. You're living the dream. You gotta keep moving forward yeah. with all these little bitty, you know, successes that happen uh-huh. that keep you going and learning and learning until you step into a bigger, you know, ring. So now let, let's talk for a second. What was bottled barbecue sauce at that moment? Mm-hmm. It was it was craft. Really good question. So as craft, it was had Casey masterpiece. They had, and okay. at that time, um, it was it had 
either just been sold or was about to be sold mm -hmm. to Clorox. Uh, so Dr. Davis in Kansas City had developed it. It was a very regional favorite, but then mm -hmm. he figured out how to broaden it. Mm -hmm. um, so Kraft, there was uh, Open Pit, which you okay. don't even hear really much about. Maybe it's some West Coast distribution. Right. Um, uh, there was another brand. Hunts had a brand. So it was really the... The billion dollar people. Yeah. people that had it, Heinz, Hunts, you know, right. KC Masterpieces, uh, Clorox. Mm -hmm. And so there was five or six of those. And then- And they were they were pretty bad and yeah. they were- uh, Cheap. Uh, it, it was just cheap, yeah. It, it, one of the things where the, I've talked to folks who work in big CPG kind of things and they say, you know, in that world, uh, the packaging's more expensive than what's inside the packaging. Yeah, and that's what we always thought of too, even though right. some of their stuff was in plastic bottles, ours were in glass, and some of them were in glass, but yeah. we knew what we were paying for glass in a case, yeah. and we knew what they were selling it for, and it was like, wow, that's 67 cents uh -huh. on the shelf after whatever the retailer's margin is, and they've got to make their margin of the manufacturing plant. It's like, they're selling it at retail cheaper than we're buying cases of glass for us. I know, wow, I know. It that? just feels, it, yeah, it feels unfair, because it is kind of unfair, yeah. but but there's a there's a path around that, which we'll get to, yeah. Yeah, and just to, to finish mm -hmm. that, yeah. uh, it, there were a couple of small little companies that if you, is mostly barbecue restaurant driven, mm -hmm. where in pockets of the Southeast or the Midwest, a um, famous barbecue place would have sold their barbecue sauce at local stores there, right. but no one had really gone to like the national like the national level um, for an independent barbecue sauce. Kind of an company. artisan craft version Correct. of this. Yeah. Now at that point, was it because I know that Stubbs would become uh, synonymous with a kind of a cleaner national brand of uh, of, of barbecue sauce? Were you guys? W were you thinking about that at that point? Was were, were you doing you were doing glass at that point, yeah. and were you doing glass yeah. deliberately again? Because you guys had had some marketing savvy uh, even even at that early stage. So was it like, oh, we think there's an opportunity to do this kind of like to be inspired by the Jack da the Jack Daniels bottle that the that Stub had already sent it to us in? Yes, and and to his credit, Stub. <clears throat> had a couple of requirements, right? He's like, mm -hmm. if it's my recipe on the bottle, it's going to be my face on the label. And mm -hmm. we're like, yeah, perfect. I'm not a master. That's you right. are. You wear this yeah. great cowboy hat and you're yeah. just genius. Yeah. And bigger than life personality. So we're like, that's why we're here. It's Absolutely. flavor and personality, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And authenticity, you know? Right. It, it, you couldn't lose with that. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we always paid three times the amount for a paper label to have a rough hewn feel to it. Right. Uh, and using certain inks that were way more expensive mm -hmm. versus driving costs down having a label for a quarter of a penny. Right. They were three or four cents a piece, so it had that feel and flavor. Gave a little, like, a little premium touch to yeah, it. Yeah, we wanted mm -hmm. people to know that it was mm -hmm. crafted and right. from an original recipe. And mm -hmm. and speaking of you know the natural, like there was no, you didn't talk natural then. There was no such thing as it. And, right. And so how we did it was it was Stubbs' recipe. I remember being down on 6th Street, which is kind of an entertainment district here in Austin. <clears throat> Lots of mm -hmm. bars and live music venues. And right. if you wanted to meet Stubb, you don't meet him at like 10 o'clock in the morning. He was a night owl. Like he right. loved going to see live music. Yeah. So we met him at a live music place. And over in a corner, he's at a little round table. And he literally wrote the recipe on a cocktail napkin, mm -hmm. of which uh, it still exists. Yeah. Uh, and that recipe was what we bought brought to our first quote unquote co-packer uh -huh. uh, to try to make that and you know Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce. That's then, right. You know, such and such. Uh, because he's just buying stuff off the grocery correct, store shelves. Correct. Yeah. And then because we're now converting it to a place that might might make 250 gallons or 150 gallons at, mm -hmm. at the time of smaller kettles. Right. Um, we're they're purchasing things in much larger lots. So we can't literally like he is, we don't have room to buy Worcestershire sauce in its full form, but right. from the same company, we'll buy the Worcestershire base. Mm -hmm. And so they make institutional type of ingredients, like right. they take the water out and then they can ship it more efficiently. Right. And so all of those ingredients, there were in some of those products, the ingredients that we we're using, sulfites or sodium benzoate or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And we were using high fructose mm -hmm. corn syrup because mm -hmm. that's what the co-packer was already using for something right. else they were using. And so um, when we went through a couple of iterations of making the first batches that Stubb was like literally approving in the right. kettle, um, you know, a little more pepper, a little more this, but still, you know, using those slightly different ingredient subsets, mm -hmm. um, 
was the most delicious barbecue sauce you'd ever had. Right. But still, we had to make a turn 10 years later to get into the Whole Foods of America. Right. We had to kind of say, all right, well, what can we do? What can we do? So it became deliberate later. Correct. You, you were just trying to do anything at that at that point. Yeah. yeah. That, which makes sense because that's the, you know, the, that, those were the available options to you at that point. And you, you knew at some point that, that Stubb himself could only make so much barbecue sauce. You had to go to... Now, I, I want to point out, you said a quote-unquote co-packer. And I think this yeah. is probably pretty interesting for people because, again, I, probably most people assume that, oh, there's just this network of... Uh, sophisticated co-packers out there and it's you know they, they just write it says co-packer on the outside of the yeah. building or whatever so we just find it again this is definitely pre-internet or like no e google yeah, back any then of that stuff all. right so how did you find somebody who could make this thing at scale that's a really good question because it you know it doesn't seem like so far ago but to any one of your listeners like a time before the internet or google like that's what it was. I remember you call information. Yeah. yeah. So it's friends and and, yeah. and word of mouth, and that's who introduced us to our first contract manufacturing up in the uh, North Texas Dallas Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. um, if you were smart enough, you would have known, which we didn't know, that there was a Texas Food Manufacturing Association, right. and you could <laughs> right. have like yeah. walked into their building here, if, the, the, if yeah. wherever they are, I think in Austin, um, and then found you know the list of them all. Now there's a PLMA, Private Label Manufacturers Association, right. show, and they have exhibitors listed on their website. And right. so it's a lot easier now, but it was even that's not super easy because it yeah. says you, you have to like apply mm -hmm. to attend the show. So yeah. it's it's not super public, but yes, there, it's still out there. Yeah. You can find it now. And we didn't even know what that relationship meant, quite honestly. Right. It's like, all right, well, hopefully a lawyer or friend of ours will know how to you know, guide us on a contract on, right. on what to do to, to create the legal form of the relationship between us. Right. You'd never seen a co-packing agreement. No, nope. all we knew was stub with a kettle mm -hmm. and, a, and a Bunsen burner that you would do crawdads with underneath uh -huh. it, yeah. you know, with a uh -huh. big wooden stick. That's right. Um, and ladling it into bottles and then wiping off the bottle and capping it. You're like, okay, I think this is good. I think, yeah. <laughs> Drop it in an ice <laughs> we, bath We did maybe. boil yeah. it, uh -huh. yes, and yeah. now it's going to be safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, it makes all the sense in the world. I love it. So so you, uh, so you, let's fast forward a little bit. Ten years in, you see an opportunity uh you know, as as the market matures, you've you've learned a lot as as you've gone along. You've become an expert at at, at sauce, and you know you've developed granular knowledge of tomatoes and all the things that you had to learn yeah. about about this world. Um, how did you? Was it a difficult decision for you to kind of take this natural turn in the business? Yes, only because we were cognizant at that time. So Stubb himself passed away about four. Five years after we started the actual formal company, moved down to Austin. Yeah, and um, his family um, inherited his shares, um, but <clears throat> there was there was a deep yearning to make sure we maintain the authenticity. I was like, did yeah. anyone change Colonel Sanders' seasoning mix? Right, right. I don't believe so. Yeah. Uh, but at some point, you also have to like move with the times, and so we're really conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And what we didn't realize. Um, and in hindsight, if we'd had someone that was a super, you know, high end COO that had been in the food manufacturing business before, we just kept continuing with the recipe until we're here in Austin. The headquarters for the largest natural food chain is here in Austin. Right. And we can't get in their stores because there's some ingredients on there that they just don't allow in. The prohibited ingredients list. Correct. Yeah. I'm like, what the heck do we do? Why? Mm -hmm. and, and they're growing and they're buying stores and opening more. It's yeah, that, that, that was those were heady days for Whole Foods Market. Correct. And <clears throat> we're like, well, there's not another retailer we haven't gotten into before, but this is where the market is going. Mm -hmm. What can we do? And so... The majority of anything that we did was really just like, you look at the ingredient and you say, I don't want to say which one it is so that I hurt, hurt the yeah. feelings of yeah. a company. But <laughs> ultimately, like we find out that most of those manufacturers of those ingredients 
are also making an exact same version of it without sulfide in it. Right, right. Because uh, they're big multi-billion dollar companies. They're sure. like, oh, well, you yeah. were ahead of us. But right. not all of them. So we have- But they're adding those things in for preservative, uh, you know, again, large industrial manufacturing, they're just trying to optimize throughput. So mm -hmm. it's it's preservatives, it's flow agents, it's mm -hmm. whatever, whatever they can do to get more out at the yeah. time and make it last longer. And not be so spread out. Right. Last more longer, uh -huh. shelf life for them. You right. know, we're buying stuff in, mm -hmm. in you know truckloads at a time and you don't mm -hmm. want it going bad three months later if you're buying nine months at a time um, but just by sheer fact of asking we found out that most of the ingredients were available from the same like oh, we yeah. have this other version without sulfide we in have it. a cleaner version yeah, of this. Well, why yeah. didn't you tell us like, well, yeah. why didn't you ask us nobody we, asked yeah. for it yeah <laughs> and there wasn't this massive push for mm -hmm. it. It was it was a groundswell. It was percolating. It was bubbling, mm -hmm. and that's when the natural food expo started. Right, and it started to grow, and more independents started. Mm -hmm. I mean. It, it, if you think about the last 10 years, it's exploded. But back then, it was like, we're just trying to get into Whole Foods. It's our hometown people. We That's hang right. out with the it's people. It's kind of embarrassing yeah. that we're not in there. It truly yeah. was. Yeah. Um, and we were literally friends with some of the buyers over there because we're yeah. shopping there and hanging out with them. Right. Uh, so it took a while, though. And yeah. I think one of the things, uh, to the credit of one of the guys on our team that was really adamant about it, is we went through a pretty formal process of, of hundreds of people going through taste tests. Mm. And until it was like... 97% of them could not tell the difference. Yeah. <clears throat> we, we kept tweaking and tweaking and tweaking, and it took a year. Mm -hmm. um, after that, every product we made um, was all natural. Was there a temptation for you to have kind of, to bifurcate the line, and so you had kind of the conventional and natural stubs? No, we thought about doing it between mm -hmm. the conventional and organic. Okay. And at that time, organic ingredients were totally unavailable unless right. you were in kind of a single ingredient type of thing like if you wanted they can to be, still be difficult even to this day yeah. but there was it was near impossible back then. think yeah. of milk if your milk's like oh i, I can make that because mm -hmm. i'll just ask this farmer to have his cows only graze and not do a certain you know right. hormone treatment or something right. and that farmer just looks at you sideways yeah and, yeah but oh, i'll pay you 20 percent <laughs> more but for us it was like 14 ingredients Right. How could I get all of these ingredients? And we sought it out, but it just wasn't available. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, so you knew, when did you know that Stubbs was going to work? Like it was really like, like this is, and again, this may be taking us back in the yeah. timeline just a bit, but like, when did you know that like, this could be a pretty big deal? Yeah, I think um, there were some false feelings of that very early on. Right. <clears throat> when we were seeing what the velocities were doing in stores. Mm -hmm. And we humped it, man. We mm -hmm. humped it. There yeah. were in yellow cabs in the yeah. beginning uh -huh. that it was like, there wasn't a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday where two of the three founders weren't mm -hmm. at a supermarket somewhere in the country right. doing two demos at two locations and then the next day two and then the next mm -hmm. day. So we knew we had to introduce it to people by sampling it to people. Right. Well, that's. I, I want to pause there a second because I, I find, like, as I talk to startup founders, I meet a lot of people who have a tendency. I meet people who want to skip steps. They think, oh, yeah, that that's cute. That's cute, Scott, that you guys did that. But I'm just going to outsource that. I'm going to be more efficient. I'm going to be more, you know, abstract myself out of the business really early on. But the like what you learned about the consumer in those face-to-face -face interactions that was you know humping and it was hard yeah. and, and grueling and you didn't want to get out of bed probably a lot of days too it's like you will never you even when you're big and you have access to all this really expensive data you'll never have the same level of rich data that's why like i encourage people mm -hmm. like if you can do a farmer's market do a farmer's market it's the best consumer research you will ever have access to because you're going to actually watch people interact with the product with your own eyes yeah. no intermediaries mm -hmm. and you can't you can't put that into an algorithm and 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 really grasp the depth of how people you know yeah I love it, you know, but their yeah. facial expression. Particularly expression, yeah. if you don't tell them you're one of the founders or owners oh, or whatever, right. because you got to like put that distance between them so they're mm -hmm. not just like telling they're you something They're not performing you for you. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'll give you two really cool examples because it's not only yeah. consumer based, but it's also the retailer based. Right. Spending a lot of time doing your own demos in a store will give you insights in how a store director works and mm -hmm. thinks. It'll give you insights into how busy they are, mm -hmm. give you insights in how the grocery manager in the store is working. Um, so, Two things. One, we only had one barbecue sauce when we first started out. One of the 
got into H-E-B here was the first one we got into, Big right, Chain, right. through Newman Distributing, <clears throat> San Antonio at the time. The next one was Publix. We got into like three or 400 Publixes through uh, Fine Distributing uh, okay. out of uh, Fort Lauderdale. Uh-huh. Um, great presentation. Everything went well. And so we're like in Florida and Texas. And we got to do demos, right? And we've got one barbecue sauce. They put a couple facings up there, and they're going to see whether or not we can do something. Doing those demos in Texas, it was like, ah, you know, we're doing really well. We go down to Florida. Right. And in Florida, particularly in the wintertime, there's a lot of older people there and from mm-hmm. different areas, not so spicy. From the Northeast or and wherever. And they're like, yeah. oh, my God, this is so spicy. Right. And yeah, I'm like, that's what? so true. Yeah. And I was like, this isn't spicy to me. And that right. became like this yeah. deep understanding that like different regions have different likings. We went back immediately and we're like, same recipe, uh-huh. cut the black pepper in half, cut the red pepper in half. That became mild. And then uh-huh. we're like, add 50% more and 50% more, and that became spicy. Yeah. So the original one uh-huh. became, you know, we, we jiggered that it out. That was medium. Then, then suddenly yeah. we had three of them, right? That's right. Just with a pepper chain. Absolutely. And you see that too. You know, it's like you can go you, you can go to the, the Northeast where you're from and you... You try salsa there, and you're like, "What? Yeah. You call this salsa? <laughs> this, how, what in the world? Yeah, it's sweet. How, how can this be? Yeah." So there are these these really distinct regional tastes. But you guys, you you read that, and because you had that face to face interaction, Correct. you actually use that as as kind of fuel for your own product innovation. Yes, and then the, the final little nuance. This is yeah. one of. 50 things you'll learn about doing that many demos. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in a store and I've got toothpicks and the store director, I think it was a Publix, store director comes over and he's like, ah, oh, this tastes really good. He goes, why the hell do you have round toothpicks in here? And I go, uh, they're, they're, we just buy them from the store we, we go to. You, you're selling them here. I just bought them. Here's my, I thought he thought I was like stealing them or something. Right, right. Um, he goes, no, 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 no. People slip and fall on round toothpicks. When you're doing a demo, you only use flat or square toothpicks. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> he Lesson just got out of one. the safety training. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So like, there's a lot more to learn with plastic gloves and hair nets and all that kind of stuff. Of course, and how yeah. to work within the confines. No extension cords that are going to be tripped over by anyone. Mm-hmm. Keep out of the way of, of an aisle because an aisle only has enough room for two carts plus 10% to pass each other. Right. So once you know that... You can then know later in your life what you're dealing with, with, right. with what's going to happen inside a merchandising event at a store. Which, which, which informs how you coach your team and if you have exactly. a, a other you know, uh, third parties who are doing this. Like you, because you've been there, you know, you know your product, mm-hmm. you know what's actually happening in the store, you know where the, who, the, who the decision makers are, how to, how to activate mm-hmm. at that, at that at that store level, yeah. like, because if you, you can have that top level buy in, you're like, well, the CEO of whatever chain loves me. You're like, yeah. I don't, it doesn't matter, man. Like yeah. you need to know, do the, does the department manager love you? Because he or she's going to, going to be the one that keeps you from going out of stock. Exactly. And yeah, you know, it's, you were talking about this in the beginning, like what are the steps that some people can, can skip? You can skip some of those, but it will come back eventually to bite you, or you better have someone else with the expertise that's right. part of your team. We just, there was no place to learn it but ourselves, and we weren't financing this thing with private equity money. It was friends and family, ten to $25,000 a check at a time. Right. So, yeah, that, that, mm-hmm. that private equity kind of ecosystem hadn't filled out in the same way, particularly on the Didn't food side. Didn't exist at yeah. all, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, you know, uh, you know, people, you know, and, they, and and you hear a lot of folks from this era, you know, Gary Hirschberg or others. It's like you're just getting checks from anybody who's willing to willing to write one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and trying to make the best of it. So so f- let's fast forward a little bit. How did you how did you decide to to move on from Stubbs, and uh, and then how did you end up? Uh, kind of transitioning. What did that transition look like when you when you found yourself at Rhythm Superfoods? You know, it was like 2008, 2009. Um, the economic downturn had just happened. And uh, some of our board members and owners mm-hmm. um, were, you know, before it was happening, but it was the the smell was in the air that something yeah. was going to go it, bad. It was, and again, for people who are maybe younger, I don't, I, I try not to take all this stuff for granted. It was, that those were a rough couple of years in almost every part of the economy. So yeah. uh, funding, uh, you know, if you if, if you were trying to raise money, it was next to impossible to raise money. It, you know, everybody everybody stuck their hands in their wallets and kept them in there real tight. And 
the real fear was that the whole world was going to come to an end. I mean, we see yeah. video footage of like, you know, the Great Depression with, you know, lines of thousands of of men in it's suits true. and hats trying to get a job or just a loaf of bread. And mm -hmm. literally that was the scare. Like Wall Street was about to crash. And, right. And so it was decided that we were going to pull back significantly from what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I had an interest in doing more. Yeah. Uh, and 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 to to some degree was that conflict with what we were what mm -hmm. the our board of which I was on the board right. but just one voice on the board right. wanted to do. Um I felt like there was nothing but growth to still be had as consumers started walking away from restaurant out right. of home. Yeah. And uh and went towards which can be I mean there you and know, it, a, a lot it, of people would say that the some of the greatest opportunities are are in those downturns and it, and it was we we yeah. had our next best year the next year after the crash right. because no one was eating out but the mm -hmm. the small indulgence they had was right. entertaining at their house right. and a small indulgence was a two dollar ninety nine cent bottle of barbecue sauce. That's right. That made it seem okay, is my, the way yeah. I sort. It was an affordable uh, in indulgence, right? So instead yeah. of instead of going to fancy barbecue restaurant and you know paying twenty dollars for your brisket, you can make something yourself, and and you feel like you got a taste of yeah. that fancy barbecue restaurant. And it was an event to barbecue yeah. outside, grill whether it was with your family or your friends. Right. It's eventing right. Uh, versus getting in a car and driving to a restaurant, which is an event too, and right. it's an indulgence. Absolutely. And I, I need to pause you there because even you saying event reminds me, I, I really want to, before we move on uh, from, from the Stubbs era, how did you guys decide that there needed to be a restaurant? Oh, I'm yeah, glad that, you yeah, up that, on so that. So this, this is important. Because so for those of you who visited <laughs> Austin, like Stubbs uh, to this day is, is this iconic uh, restaurant, mainly known as, as an outdoor music venue and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But it, it didn't always exist. Yeah, so Stubb himself, C.B. Stubblefield, mm -hmm. half of his path of, of, of fame as a barbecue master and, and as a man mm -hmm. uh, was the barbecue side. Like he was just a brilliant chef, cook. Mm -hmm. he, call himself a cook. Right. Um, the other half of it was his love for music and musicians, and he would follow musicians anywhere. He wanted to cater every, sh you know, any major show, and right. whether it be Rolling Stones or, you know, Jesse Guitar Taylor, you uh -huh. know, playing at some smaller joint here in Austin. Um, and since he had had several restaurants throughout mm -hmm. his, his life, Stubb as a brand mm -hmm. needed a place to hang his hat. And so from day one, even though there wasn't a Stubbs when we jumped in and started the sauce company, um, my partners and I, and Stubb in particular, mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a month where we weren't looking at a piece of land somewhere. Right. And, uh, and I remember there's two or three of them that came really, really close. <clears throat> and, but the location where it is right now in the corner of 8th mm -hmm. and Red River was something that I, I believe it was Eddie um, had found it driving around and saw it. Uh, but Stubb had also independently found it. And like, it was kind of like one of those jinx moments where yeah. we were all together. You both show like, up at hey, the same place. Hey, I gotta show you this place, it's over here. And right. we arrived there and we're like, oh my God, this. Was it vacant or was it was it being used for anything else? Two things were happening there. Oh, three things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's right on Waller Creek, which is a running mm -hmm. creek on the backside of it, mm -hmm. right in downtown Austin, really close to 6th Street and I-35. And it's a whole city block. Uh, and at, at the time, it, what, what was available was only about a third of what we have right now. There was right. three different owners of parcels connected. Um, but there was the front part of it. It was like a 160-year-old building that had been built up over time. It was like Austin's first dress shop. And mm -hmm. before that, it was a place where Mexican stonemasons had moved up to help right. build certain buildings. Very limestone facade yeah. and all that. And uh -huh. so it was old and had three different um, you know, stone and stucco and brick and... Um, but in the back, there was a lady that was that was living there, um, and she had some like pigs and chickens running around what is now the amphitheater, right? And just had it kind of fenced in. It was just a yard. Yeah, it was yeah. a yard. And then behind her was this longer building, which is now the restaurant's office, and that's where all kinds of shenanigans were going on. There was there was an encampment in there, you know, with you know. Needles and all kinds of stuff. Going oh yeah. On. So because this is uh, a, again back then shady area, of town. super shady. Yeah, still can be a bit a bit shady in oh, that yeah, part of town yeah. to this day. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, yeah. once we saw that, we we're like, this is perfect. It's downtown. Austin's growing. 
we had been looking at stuff, stuff really far away, like the Salt Lake was open then, and oh yeah, you know, it felt like you were going all go the way to, to Lubbock driftwood, to go yeah. to the Driftwood. But like, uh, this was like, wow, this is close. Let's let's see what we can do. So right. we decided to buy that piece of land mm -hmm. and gather an investment group together. Mm -hmm. Not everyone that was part of the Sauce Company's investment group wanted to risk their money on a restaurant. So right. some of them were the same. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of my close friends, Browning mm -hmm. family couple of the boys in the Browning family, Will and, and Bob, had put much of the money in and committed first first off, and then we filled uh -huh. it in with other people. Uh -huh. um, but we did it on the cheap. Like, we bought the land, and there was a building there. Right. And for the next year, we did it ourselves. Like, the only things that we, we contracted out were the things you had to. Like, mm -hmm. we need some uh, framing inside to make the building stable, right. all new plumbing, all new electrical. But, you know, if you're walking on the floors, I probably did the nail gun on half of those floor planks. Mm -hmm. uh, we've redone my bad job of tiling in the bathrooms, but originally that was all my tiling work right, in the bathroom. Right. You learned. Yeah. yeah you <laughs> so, got a got a, a book at Home Depot or something it, like that. Yeah. It, in, in what it is right now, it was nowhere near what it is right now. And it's still a little bit of like hell's half acre down there. It's That's not, right. It's not clean and beautiful. But what did you think it was? Was the was the thesis at that point that uh, the brand, yes. the sauce, needs a showcase? It, and, and, and was it always, was it food and music? Always. Always. So the day we opened, it was live music mm -hmm. and a smaller outdoor stage than we have right now with yeah. no cover on it. Um, because Stubb just had this great network of people that wanted to be around him and play, right. and we wanted to continue that legacy. Mm -hmm. um, the sad part was we, we had put the investors together, and let me just say it's something like four or five hundred thousand dollars, something like right. that, to buy the first piece of land and a little bit of money to build out what we were doing in the nineties or early two thousand. Ninety four or okay. five. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, that's a lot of money back then. It's still yeah. a lot of money today, but it's it like you know inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a big investment. In a in a not sure thing area, uh, that part of you know downtown wasn't as nice uh, at, at that point as no. As it we is knew today. Uh, yeah. us being there was like the first cleanup of that area. It was horrible. Yeah. It's still not the cleanest place, but a couple of hotels have moved in. It's getting better. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely we 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 mm -hmm. colloquialize it by saying like it's it's the perfection of the brand. The brand was on all these shelves and Stubb was who he was and we were you know websites were just starting to to happen right but if you could come visit and taste Stubb's recipe mm -hmm. uh, then whatever the brand meant on a store shelf you would be perfecting that relationship that a consumer would have with the brand right. by having a place to come to so right. that we knew that that and you had felt to like happen. that legitimized the brand too because for a yeah. lot of people they do associate and you'd mentioned this earlier that oh it's a restaurant the restaurant makes a sauce mm -hmm. they bottle the sauce and then they sell it and so you guys did it backwards correct yeah, uh, he had had his restaurants, of course, yeah, and 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 uh, with all kinds of different levels of success or failure. But uh, mm -hmm. we just knew that if we had a restaurant, it was both of them were going to feed each other, which they still do to this day. Right. The, I mean, I can't tell you the dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of people a week that come in. They happen to be here for business or a trade show or mm -hmm. a convention or whatever they're doing. Right. And they have three bottles in their refrigerator, and they've got to have a meal at Stubbs. They do. And, yeah, and, it's a pilgrimage. Yeah. And likewise, like if you're here eating mm -hmm. at Stubbs, you suddenly become, you know, someone that's going to buy it on the shelf. Because later on. then you you went to your your hometown or home city, and it reminds you of your trip to Austin. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have a really good time when they come to Austin, yeah. so it's a favorable memory. Yeah. And if you go in there, there's all kinds of memorabilia photos of Stubb, backyard barbecuing, hanging mm -hmm. out with all the greats from you know Do Dolly Parton and uh, you know just. You know George Jones. Right. He's got his arms around Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash. So it's real. It's the yeah. real deal. Yeah. So we knew we had had to have a place to express that that you know authenticity. Right. So do you think that more brands should take that sort of thing seriously? Um, <clears throat> not every brand has to be authentic like that. Hmm. I think in the category that we were in, authenticity, and not that something else can't be successful without it, but right. the nature of the brand of barbecuing, the people that do it a lot, they live and die on 
on perfecting their own personal relationship with how they cook and they know their right. cold spots on the grill. Right. A lot, of, a lot more people grill than they do smoke. Right. So authenticity and really delicious flavor were key. Right. That, 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 I don't know if that lends itself to the energy bar for every segment in the energy bar category. Totally fair. So you just got to run mm -hmm. deep with right. what makes you you. Right. But then sometimes, you know, again, for uh, some barbecue purists, they're like, well, sauce is superfluous. You, you don't even need this. Yeah. Right. So the, now you're like, you've got to be authentic to yourselves, yeah. but then there is a certain set that thinks, well, authentic, you know, real barbecue Particularly sauce. Particularly yeah. here, we have right. like this, you know, middle of the 1800s, the Czech and German right. migration of immigrants coming into this area, bringing their beer and sausage mm -hmm. and smoking and curing. Right. And coat the thing in black pepper. And they're yeah. still here. And most of those places are not giving you a bottle of sauce or a ladle. You know, some of them are, but if not all of them. you ask yeah. for it sometimes, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just not part of that. Yeah. It's, it, particularly like Central Texas. Um, okay, so sorry, I, I, I interrupted you, but I wanted to hear hear that story. So then uh, you had said, downturn, uh, board decides, we really need to scale this thing back, be more conservative. You That wasn't what you were thinking needed to happen. Um, and again, Stubbs would go on and, and, and uh, continued uh, af after your your departure, and you mm -hmm. were involved there through the end. Eventually, sold to McCormick yep. uh, several years later. Um, but well before that happened, you made a you made a decision to to try something else. Yeah, I mean, when we went in that direction, I, you know, we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. Um, I was still there as the CEO, but trying to figure out, you know. Do we just wait this out? What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. I started getting interested myself and saying, well, been here for 18 years or 17 years, whatever it was at the time. It's like, it could uh, get a little stale. It could yeah. go do something else and mm -hmm. still, you know, stay on the board and help, you know, in that manner, whatever I can do. Right. So that's where I started spending a little bit of time looking around. And I had a friend here in Austin, Clayton Christopher, who had met a guy named Keith War who was making kale chips he's making a lot of things wasn't lot of he stuff, yeah, yeah yeah really broad you yeah know. just this creative musician guy who was making yeah. just creating stuff smoothies and kale chips and all almost this stuff. everything yeah. that he was making back then was uh -huh. before its time it right. was always ahead of his time timing like all is the important. stuff right yeah. now that's coming out and becoming successful i'll give keith that is like uh -huh. he's always about five or seven years ahead of it so right talk to him now start the business slowly <laughs> and in seven right. years it's a big deal it'll be perfect yeah but the, the kale chips that he was making at the the daily juice juice bar uh and the dehydrator were incredibly delicious mm -hmm. <clears throat> we had just gone through the process of going natural mm -hmm. with the Stubbs brand right had been to the expo west a couple times and mm -hmm. i'm like blown away there's you know, natural toothpastes and deodorants and foods and beverages. And it's and, growing. And it's yeah. growing big time. And, you know, a an energy there mm -hmm. at that time that was almost like the new world. We just got right. off the ship and like, what can you do here in the great America? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and versus like, you know, and we, we go to all the shows, but like mm -hmm. at the fancy food show, there was an established group of people. There's a lot of import it's stuff coming specialty in there. Gourmet, Specialty gourmet, imported. And, yeah, it, uh -huh. and that has transitioned as well into everything. Right. But at the time it was very hardcore, natural, organic stuff that was mm -hmm. going on at the Expo West. Right. And so I was like, Whatever I'm going to do, I've been doing a lot of barbecue and I'm an expert at it. Mm -hmm. Like I've spent the nights at the Kansas City barbecue contests and right. uh, with some of the best to see how they do it. And But I want to slightly do something else. And and if I could pick a path, can I, can I pick a path that, one, is economically where the world is going. Right. Two, that... Um, maybe favors my health mm -hmm. <laughs> so that sure. barbecue and, and yeah. ribs and, and brisket <laughs> isn't all that I'm known for. That's right. Not, and not, not, the, not the best long-term path if that's the only thing that you're yeah. eating. Yeah. So I was thinking like, all right, yeah. well, kale chip's pretty, like that's so it's far over to the other side. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I loved them. And yeah. so I just started hanging out with, uh, with Robbie and Keith and kind of like just you know, at night, go over there, see what they were doing. So they there were, was like one daily juice or there was, something? There was yeah. two daily juices. Okay. A third one had just opened where they were, they had another bigger dehydrator. And they were uh -huh. actually selling them um, to uh, Wheatsville Co-op mm -hmm. here. In, in, there was one at the time and two of the Whole Foods. And they were delivering every day right. to the back door and scanning them in and, and right. a very inefficient way of getting it done. But they couldn't keep they the did. kale chips off the shelf. And did. they were selling energy bars and, and mixes of, of you know, 
of mushroom powders and things like that. So there was all kinds of things they were doing. Right. Um, and self-delivering, and the numbers were incredible for the kale chips, like, mm. you know, 10 units or 20 units or 30 a week or whatever. Mm -hmm. They couldn't make enough because all they had was one dehydrator at the time, then bought another dehydrator. Right. So I was like, this is kind of special. There's something going on here. And maybe it's kale and maybe it's the other stuff or maybe it's just natural right. good food. So I took some samples and started se sending them to like folks outside of the zone because mm -hmm. Austin can be a bubble. Absolutely. You can start to believe that everyone is yeah. as healthy as they are here in Austin. That's right, yeah. And the brokers and some of the buyers that I was sell sending the bags to, and they were like, coffee bags, right? Brown paper coffee bags with a sticker on it. Yeah. Uh, they're like the U, this. The U-line, like I, yeah, this is a exactly. sad, sad little brown bag. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So there was a lot of encouragement. And so I started hanging out there more. And on the mm -hmm. weekends, looking at pro formas of mm -hmm. how do we scale this, investigating equipment, yeah. and, and can we find co-packers for yeah. this? Now, did you, at that, at that point, did you think of yourself as a startup guy? Is that like self-identity wise? Yeah. You did, and you know, I, like you'd owned it because you you'd been there, right? So you've been doing this now yeah. for a while. But but Stubbs had gotten bigger, yeah. and so you you hadn't in your head said, "Well, I'm I'm just a big corporate guy again" or something like that. No, I yeah. felt scrappy and yeah, and and I still do. Like yeah. at some point, rhythm where I'm at right now, it's mm -hmm. like I don't know where the the wall is, but it's somewhere ahead of me. Right, and um, and then I'm not afraid to jump in at the ground. And right. some people aren't comfortable there, but yeah, um, I am, and I know like what it takes. It's it's just all you know. Don't take no for an answer and right. keep pivoting. Yeah, so we're it's, getting positive feedback on that right. product, and I'm indicating to my board, it's like, hey, let's get ready. I'm 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 uh -huh. on my way out here mm -hmm. and. And uh, we're in good hands with folks that'll be here. And mm -hmm. we eventually found a guy named Matt Gates who, who took in uh, right. the CEO role right. for the next four years or five years that yeah, he Matt's built Yeah, Matt's a it. super good guy. Yeah. yeah. And he, he did a marvelous job of getting it ready for the big time, which was preparation for getting it sold to someone. Right. Um, and meanwhile, I was starting this other company, which was basically a, a, an organic uh, vegetable and now fruit. Uh, snack company right. um, that hopefully delivers more nutrition and and goodness than the snacking that we're doing on a daily basis in America. That's a twenty billion dollars worth of sales of the other stuff. Right now, so <clears throat> now you mentioned that you you thought again you came out of a what what was is at least perceived to be a you know commodity pantry staples type type business, and in your head. With some, you know, you you've been seasoned through through going through all mm -hmm. these experiences. You thought snacking, that's interesting, right? So, and and like you're thinking about the natural organic thing. You're thinking about snacking, mm -hmm. which tend to be as you had begun to encounter potentially a much more high velocity uh, category mm -hmm. or item and that sort of thing. And that was deliberate for you, right? The snacking part was. It was just one. Yeah. Uh, the word snacking was not deliberate, other than. The box checking, if I remember correctly how I was thinking, mm -hmm. when we picked the barbecue sauce category, it was growing at like 2 or 3% when we jumped in. Mm -hmm. And that's a, like a half a point more than the population growth. So that's like just slightly above grocery sales growth, right? right? So in the world of being successful, there's a couple of things that you want behind you as the wave that you're going to ride. Mm -hmm. One of it is, is what is the growth of the category? And, right. and if you can jump on a wave that has 5, 10, 15% segment or category growth, then all people lift up nicely right. versus battling it out for a share. And that right. really was the barbecue business. That's if right. If we hadn't had the authenticity. You have to take it from somebody else exactly. to get any business. And if we hadn't had the authenticity of Stubb and the great recipes that we mm -hmm. had, um, we would just have been another person that was two and a half times more expensive than the guys that know how to make it cheaper. Right. <clears throat> right. So, Whereas if you're a, 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 you know, let's say five years ago or so, you're a kombucha you know, and, and you're exactly. creating a new category. You're not you're not taking from other kombucha companies because there weren't any. Right. right. Yeah. And I think um, it's prescient that you said snacking because it was just starting to be at that time that the there's all kinds of prognosticators that are saying right. here's what the next twenty years will be like, and yeah. if you can get your hands on the data that's real, you know, and then put it together. Like America was 
changing their behavior significantly at the Mm -hmm. time. And people were just starting to put their hands around what the data meant. We were not sitting down for long meals anymore. We were Mm -hmm. eating many more meals, smaller meals, smaller calories. On the go. Snacking. Yeah. And so everyone saw that whether it was healthy or unhealthy, Mm -hmm. that's where we were going. Yeah. What can you do? And if you look at a store right now and what they merchandise versus what was being merchandised 10, 15 years ago, the space that's given to grab and go and it's not just potato ready to chips, eat, yeah. ready to drink, sandwiches, yeah. single units of yogurt, uh, you prepared, know, prepared foods, prepared yeah. foods that mm-hmm. are just one thing. Mm-hmm. And so that, whether it's refrigerated or it's you know grab and go near the right in its own aisle, uh, mm-hmm. that that is that is followed through. It's been truthful, and so snacks are continuing to be the wave of the future for how we are changing our behavior. Right. So so you <clears throat> found this you found this kind of uh, below the radar company here uh, in in Austin mm-hmm. that was and, and they're looking they were like down on Barton Springs yeah, or somewhere exactly. around there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so you said, I think they're on to something and you decided, okay, now now is the time. What did you you know, besides having you know a, a, a craft paper uh, bag of uh, kale chips that you'd sent around to some people and, and validated, yeah, people actually love this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you do next after that? So you try to get your first door to open so yeah. that you can create a data story. <clears throat> and but they had they had uh, a couple of Whole Foods and and a you know a, a Wheatsville at the time. And, yeah. And so did you try? Was your first impulse to? Uh, professionalize it or kind of rebrand yes, and yes. things like that? Definitely yeah. uh, professionalize it. And with the partners, I mean, they, right. you know, Keith had designed the logo and mm-hmm. and for a very short period of time, the, the, the juice bar, mm-hmm. the Jamba Juicy kind of place right. was called Daily Juice, is called Daily Juice. Mm-hmm. Um, we quickly found out that consumers got confused with that with snacks. Right. And um, like, when, are, you, are you juicing the kale? Yeah. And so we went through a period of like, you know, a month or two of like, you know, self-introspection, like what should we really be calling this? Yeah. Let's not think so small. And the juice bars, we're going to start growing and open for more of those. And mm-hmm. then there's going to be confusion. Do they really help each other? So we separated the juice bars from the food company. Right. <clears throat> split those two. I ran that. We had another person running the juice bars. Um, mm-hmm. And so as a food company, we changed the name to Rhythm Superfoods. Mm-hmm. Um Rhythm seemed to be a name that Austin's really is very musical. Musical rhythm of your life, rhythm of your body. It mm-hmm. also it was great, right? Except later, I mean, now to spell it in an email is really fundamentally difficult. That's right. For like, Although it's second nature for you now, yeah, but yes, sixty yeah. percent of the uh, <laughs> world here does an H or a Y differently. Uh-huh. So um, came up with the name, and there was this professionalization. I had to get it out of the coffee bag, if you will. Yeah. So that took six nine months too. We're working with designers right. and working with film producers, and you know. Mm-hmm. The first one was like, okay, but we had that inventory of it, so we're going to go through that. The next one, then we start paying more for the uh, for the designers. The Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, the more you pay, the better you get. I'm not going to say it's always that way. Right, right. Because right. <clears throat> we all find those great gems of design that are like, hmm, they're reasonable. Right. And he or she really got us, right? Yeah, yeah. And are able to express uh-huh. it. But you do find that once you get into a certain zone, you're like, all right, we need to be able to get someone that really knows what they're doing, has two or three people. Right. It's sort of like a medical professional at, at some point, or a, yeah. you know, a, a dentist, or a, you know, like, oh, you're the you you do a lot of root canals. You're probably really good at root canals. Exactly. Yeah. And you'll see their their yeah. portfolio of twenty different brands. You're like, okay, they know what they're doing. Right. So the same thing is true with uh, designers and brokers and other service providers and things like yeah. that. So we found um, we found a couple of people uh, first using a guy locally here, Toby is no longer with us, but right. he did a super job at creating the brand mm-hmm. of Rhythm Superfoods. And we started, all right, it's printable bag. It's costing mm-hmm. us a lot less than stickers right. and brown bags before. Right. And now we're producing cases and now mm-hmm. I got to figure out how to scale. Right. Right. I can't find a co-packer because the specialty like, like forced air warm dehydration process that is mm-hmm. demanded for long periods of time so that you're not baking it. Right. But just... Low temps. Low temp. You're having air that's drier than what's inside the chamber blow across 
you know, mm-hmm. the moist kale that has a flavor sauce on it. And 10 to 12 hours later or 12 to 14 hours later, depending on the machine you're working with, mm-hmm. it's like dry enough that nothing will ever grow in it. And it'll right. be sh- shelf stable yeah. for like six or nine so the, months. You, the water activity is is below. So it, it, it allows like safety. Thing, yeah, it's food safety and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, could not find anyone that had, well, there were people that had dehydrators, mm-hmm. but they were like, all right, well, we've got seven of them up here, but for five months every fall, we're 24 hours a day Deer making jerky. this, mm-hmm. you know, or yeah. a plum or whatever. Uh-huh. And so never really found the right And this place. is a real, this is a common challenge. If you're doing something innovative, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like if you're doing the same thing that everybody else is already doing, there's probably a lot of, you know, it's like, eh, just plug and play, no big deal. But often when you're you're really trying to pioneer a new category or new new product, it's going to be tough like this because there's not just an obvious solution. You may right. have to kind of figure it out yourself, engineer it yourself. So with barbecue sauce, whether we had 10 or 14 ingredients, they were always sitting in pallets in the warehouse mm-hmm. whenever we needed to scale up. Right. And there was a hundred, I mean, as you know, with Ponder Foods, like there's a hundred competitors around the country that have the equipment needed right. to put something hot and pasteurized in into a bottle That's and right. then put a label on it and a cap mm-hmm. and make it look good. Um, and and so the, the assets of those plants have been usually paid for over many years. Right. So if, if someone and that comes equipment in, lasts a long time. Forever. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so if you come in there and say, hey, I've got another 20,000 cases a month I want to deliver to you, you're like, oh, my God, I can give you a great no price. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because now you get to spread you know, right. 20,000 cases over whatever overhead right. you have and it's yeah. making everything more profitable. Rather than you, the brand, having to pay a million dollars for a piece of – because all this machinery is very Which may expensive. may only be operated for – two shifts a week to begin with. Right, because you don't have the volume yet. Correct. Yeah, so, so you're, you're not you're not gaining the efficiencies or economies of scale. It, it presents a lot of chicken or egg problems for yeah. a brand. And I think, you know, nowadays with private equity investment, there, there are many private equity people that don't want to get involved in the asset and CapEx game. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd like their money to go to growth. But right. when you find yourself in where we are, there's an upside to it as well. Like mm-hmm. what we have done, it, I'm going to say it's simple, but it's difficult. Yeah. I take from an organic farmer produce out of his or her field, and hopefully it hasn't rained for the past week, so you don't have to wait four weeks to get it out of the field. Right. I take it out of there. It is in a dehydration. It's in a cleaning it's cleaned. plant four hours uh-huh. later, and it's if it's a carrot, the top mm-hmm. and the tail has been cut off, mm-hmm. and it's been uh, you know a little skin has been taken off of the outside. And it's in our plant being made into a dried snack within 24 hours. Yeah. Um, that ebb and flow. So you have to get as close to the source as you can possibly get. Correct. Because if you're shipping that, you can't ship that kale from one end of the country to the other end of the country or across borders. We were. That. Yeah. And it was difficult. Yeah. And it presented itself with, wow, by about day seven or eight or nine, the kale's starting to look limp. Mm-hmm. And this truck got caught at the border because you're sourcing you never from know. Yeah. organic farmers in Mexico, California, wherever, or it just rained in California in your contracted field. You can't get anything out of there for four or five weeks. Oh, what are you going to do? Right. The people show up at the plant the next day no matter what. So yep. it, the simplicity of how we make it is simple. The supply chain of what we do is a moat. The, va- that- the variables that go into actually manufacturing the product are uh, there are multi- hundreds of yeah. them. Yeah, and that's a moat though, because mm-hmm. like you said, like if you came out with a ready to drink tea right now, mm-hmm. you, within Texas, there's five or ten people that can make it and bottle it. Give them a recipe yeah, tomorrow. Like next week. By next yeah. Friday, they'll do it for right. you. Right. But if you say, I've got this really unique way that I'm going to make this, this, and this, mm-hmm. you may have to go out and forge your own way because there are no co packers available. And that's where that's we right. find ourselves in. So that's we right. invested hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on um, bagging, dehydration, processing equipment, and had these quasi co packing relationships where. We'd bring in the equipment. Right. They manage the the, the raw materials right. and, and staff the production, and uh, and then made it for us for a which, total which fee. Those sorts of hybrid relationships are, uh, I mean, they're a unique challenge. Obviously, you talked about like super capital intensive, uh, time and attention intensive. There is there can be 
a happy accident along the way that is that's the best way in the world for you and your team to really understand your product, right? And so again, that kind of yeah. gets back to my comment earlier about skipping steps. Even when you have an obstacle, something that that is unfortunate or difficult, uh, there can be a silver lining to it. And that is, if if there were just a you know super easy, and you just like, well, I, you know, this this co-packer relationship is a it's a black box. I I put in money into the black box and mm-hmm. out spits out kale chips on the on the other end of it. I'm great with that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, but you you didn't have that luxury, and so it forced you and your team to actually, like, you had to be pretty intimately involved in understanding how how one makes kale chips. Absolutely. Yeah. Like when we were in Austin for the first two years making it in a commercial kitchen, but we bought, I think, nine of these smaller sized Harvest Saver dehydrators, uh-huh. and we were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We were moving truckloads a week. Sure. Uh, in a very small space. Yeah. So as I know fast every as you angle could crank would, them out. As yeah. fast as we could crank them out. And then we moved to another one in North Texas, mm-hmm. you know, expressed ourselves to the highest level that we could there, moved to another place in Colorado, mm-hmm. and then started getting to the point where we're like, we really need to be right next to the fields. Mm-hmm. So where are we going to go? Are we going mm-hmm. to California? Are we going to the border? Mm-hmm. If you don't know, in, in yeah. the U.S., like, 35, 40% of the produce comes from Mexico right. in the in the U.S., uh, particularly in the winter. It's like 60% and less right. so in the summer. But um, Because weather. Yeah, yeah. weather. So mm-hmm. we're down in a zone in the state of Jalisco near Guadalajara in Guadalajara mm-hmm. where the zone 150 miles around that center point right there, they're growing stuff 12 months out of the year. Right. It, you know, there's a rainy and a dry season, but... Um, it's a very, all the major U.S. growers are down there with big operations, whether they're, it's, you know, right. Taylor Farms or Giants, you know, California Giant Strawberries. And a few tequila operations. And a lot of tequila <laughs> operations, too. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So we had to do this quasi, you know, purchase the equipment because ultimately, yeah. like, if you don't have the equipment and you're trying to figure it out, you're either going to go build your own plant and buy the equipment anyway or you're finding someone and and asking them to buy it, well, they have to look at your financials and know exactly that you're safe to invest a million dollars in equipment. There's a lot of risk in that for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and that's. I think that 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 presents all those all those different challenges. A lot of times, I I tell people, it's uh, you do what you have to do, right? You you know, you're 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 running through walls, you're jumping over walls, but uh, as a rule of thumb, you are like the path of least resistance is you you don't necessarily want to be your own manufacturer unless you have it, you're Scrooge McDuck and you just have so much money that you're you're, yeah. you're bathing in it and or you have a very specific set of skills personally or on your team where you're an industrial engineer, chemical yeah. engineer, mechan- like if you actually are an expert at this stuff then that might make some sense for yeah. you but in, in my experience, and I have a feeling in your experience, most of the natural and organic uh, food company founders, that's not their background. It's not. It's usually sales and marketing, if you right. typically, and, yeah. and not the, 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 the operation side. And you are correct. Most people go that way to the contract packing way right. because it's, it's like 70% of the problems you have is supply chain. Yeah, and so unless you come straight out of the gate with an incredible team that tackles everything perfectly, it's a lot easier to tackle the sales and marketing right. issues that come up than what than what it is to tackle like oh I'm making an energy bar. Well, there's right. 40 people that do extruded energy bars within mm-hmm. five hours of here, right? right. So right. why would you reinvent the wheel? Right. In the end, if you were really cranking out like 50 million dollars a year in revenue. Um, and you know, gosh, I'm giving up so much margin by giving this guy this business. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I really hate that that we do that. Well, right. in the very beginning, or you wanted to make it private label for Trader mm-hmm. Joe's or some other yeah. place like that. There might be some justification, but you're exactly right. right. Yeah. In the, in the very beginning, like you, your bars are going to cost you two dollars a bar rather than thirty two cents a bar, right. because you have bought all this asset right. building yeah. and paying rent and electricity and lights manufacturing and only really only works at scale like yeah. e- the economics work at scale it's you know people think oh i'm going to go to a co-packer i'm going to get it cheaper yeah. like at, at in the beginning mm, no 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 <laughs> like but if you need again you need uh that that path to be able to scale and and yes down the road you're going to get it for much much cheaper and so yeah. everyone in the beginning mm-hmm. because the prices are higher until you get to that scale mm-hmm. you're eating it on margin 
right. to prove out the success of the product. Yeah. Because it's hard to prove out the success of the product unless you're pricing it at the price that a consumer will take it for. Right. Uh, as, You've you got know, to find that. Yeah. You know uh, very well, having yeah. been at Siete, it's like those almond tortillas, the fresh tortillas. They were that, expensive. They were expensive. But- the consumers who were mm -hmm. really hardcore into that, whether it was right. a paleo or a keto mm -hmm. or whatever the, right. the the dietary function was, they were so passionate about it. Um, those were expensive to make. They and, were. But there was a, a really awesome set of consumers that were willing to pay that price. Right. And like, if you want it to be more mainstream down the mm -hmm. line, the price right. is going to have to go down. But right. who knows? Maybe there's enough people to take that price. That's right, but it takes a while because you know we had a similar story to what you know. We're, there were days where we we're we had a, a, a bunch of ladies in a hand in pressing. a kitchen hand pressing, hand flipping on a griddle as fast as we could, and that like you you reach your ceiling pretty quickly yeah, at that right. point, right? Before yeah. automation kicks in. That's yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so then so you 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 grow rhythm. It starts as uh, kale chips, yeah. right? Um, but then you, you, over time, you're diversifying into a lot of different types of uh, fruits and vegetables and things like that. How did you, you know, how have you understood or grown in your, uh, your understanding of what's the right path for innovation? Are you, is it, are, are you just throwing ideas against the wall or are you, is it all data driven or is it, uh, is it experimentation? Are you, are you learning from focus groups? How do you, how do you decide, oh, we really need to go hard into beets or cauliflower or pineapples or whatever it is? That's a really good question because I think, um, like depending on who you talk to, there's going to be different people that have different answers for this, but we embrace all all of them, like epiphanies. Yeah. Epiphanies are, are just as good, and, and, but we, we, we institutionalize it by making ourselves, throw ourselves in front of where epiphanies can happen. Mm -hmm. I have hired several of the top um, you know, product development companies and we worked well with them. And maybe we didn't get the product we wanted, but we got an idea over here. Right. Um, we go through the data trove mm -hmm. of walking down the aisle, taking notes, What's a slow category that needs some some revelation? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll go back and see if we can find some data on that particular category and see what's going on. And 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 then you'll look at trends like <clears throat> if you're looking at a trend like grain free mm -hmm. and gluten free. If right. it's without grain, you don't mm -hmm. have the gluten. So that's right. It, all right. Well, what categories have still are holding on to things right. with gluten that right. need help. Which is tricky, by the way, too, because like when we did, so that, that was a very deliberate move uh, at, at Siete, Siete, right? Because at the time that we were, you know, kind of still in the very nascent like stage, there was a temptation to say, oh, it should be paleo. Right, yeah. and so so it's like there, you you should put paleo forefront and grain. The only thing that was grain free at that time was dog food. There was some <laughs> yeah. some and when we there was some concern like oh man we're we're gonna have a really negative association with this. There but, wasn't anyone doing the grain free then. No no no. Like so it was a thing that we it was a very thoughtful decision and we said no we're gonna just own this yeah. and and put it. So if, I mean it's still to this day. It's Probably the largest font on uh, on on a, any any Siete product yeah. package, right? So it, but over time, then it becomes a trend mm -hmm. in its own way. But uh, you know, if it, it, it's hard to detect those things at times, you almost have to read between the lines to to say even if people don't say grain free, is there is there a market for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that we also do, um, we have different technologies. I call it technologies, but one of them is big commercial convection ovens. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a way that you can process something. And we make our roasted kale that we exclusively sell at Costco mm -hmm. in, in that technology. I've got other two technologies that are vacuum related and, mm -hmm. and high you know, yeah. barometric pressure vacuums. And they do something interesting with what we do. And then we have just forced air dehydration. Right. And so another avenue is our R&D crew, which is pretty strong and, mm -hmm. and we've got three people that are almost full time thinking about it all the time. Yeah. It's like go to the store and find every fruit and every vegetable and over the next, you know, months and year or see whatever, what you can do to see them. See what, what you can do. <laughs> so let's be yeah. open to, you right. know, epiphany just through that direction. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile we're hiring certain people to do certain things. 
We reach out and go to various trade shows and walk the aisles mm-hmm. to see where ingredients are going and start right. thinking. And then we'll just do flat out, you know, four times a year, whiteboard, mm-hmm. no idea is a bad idea, and right. and see where they hit. Um, I well, and I think that it's that kind of experimental learner's mentality that's so important because, you know, I think of it like if you're if you're a scientist and you're doing a scientific experiment and the experiment fails, the only thing that fails is if you didn't learn something from it, right? Yeah. That like that actually the exercise of running the experiment cannot fail. Yeah. If you you had a hypothesis, you tested the hypothesis, it came out or it didn't come out the way that you thought it was going to, then you keep iterating. That's sort of the nature of it. And even like with the ones that succeed and go through our gates, if you will, um, we'll launch them and we have failures. Um, Some of them aren't just Uh like, we had one that was awesome, delicious, great. As we tried to scale its production, we could not do it and you know, when you first launch something, you just, one region of Whole Foods is 40 stores, and we're just testing it out. Mm-hmm. It's doing great. But like, it's like ducks on the water where the feet are scrambling below the water right. to like try you to figure out. can barely fulfill like, those orders. We'll never get to scale right. here in how we are set up now. And we didn't know that when we launched it. So then right. we're like, okay, we got to pull back on this. It was a, right. a sweet potato chip, a dehydrated sweet potato chip. And yeah. it was sticky, it stuck to the trays and, and the ability to make it quickly and at cost, it was going to be like seven ninety nine for a small bag. We're like, no, right. we'll ever buy it. The consumer it. doesn't want to pay yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, you and sometimes you only discover that stuff at scale too, because maybe you didn't experience that when you were making it in a little baking sheet yeah. or something like that, exactly. right? Yeah, so now <clears throat> somebody could look from from the outside in. They say, man, Scott Jensen, he's uh, like, this guy, he's a big shot. He, he was a co-founder of Stubbs. They uh, they they learned you know they learned and grew eventually had this this cool exit they sold the company to uh, to McCormick yeah it took a long time but you know he's he's mentored and 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 helped out a lot of different different food and, and beverage startups across his career he's now been doing rhythm for several years you know got investment from all these you know from 301 Inc and and it has it knows everybody in the industry and that sort of thing so. Like this is easy, right? Like for somebody, for somebody like Scott Jensen, like man, just like snap, 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 just do the thing, scale it up, pop, pop. Like what next challenge, right? What what's the what's the reality of, you know, again, even somebody who has a lot of knowledge and relationships, is it that easy for you still? Uh, you know, if you ask my investors, they'd be like. <laughs> When is this going to get to the level <laughs> that, you promised? That level, yeah. <laughs> that you right, promised. right, yeah. Like, we hit brick walls all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> and they are product development brick walls, finalizing investment brick walls. Sure. Uh, everyone will tell you that there's tons of money sitting on the side waiting to come in. And you're like, okay, well, you have to have like that one in a hundred There's tons of money if they're, if you have the right deal that everybody else wants, wants. in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, the Rhythm Superfoods company, compared to Stubbs, they were equally as difficult. Early on at Stubbs, just gaining traction and sleeping in your car so you could save the money and get to the next door to do a demo the next day and having a little wet wipe on your face, that was your shower. Mm-hmm. That's kind of difficult when I look back on it. Yeah. And, and you know, we did It's that. a little bit romantic though, yeah, yeah at and the that, same time. Yeah. And that <laughs> whole company, we raised like $1.2 million of friends and family dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, over to, the whole 20 over the whole years. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And we mm-hmm. got it all in the first six years or seven years yeah. and it became profitable. Uh-huh. Um, and that, you know, it's been 15 times that for Rhythm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we've moved faster. Uh, but we haven't moved, uh, you know, compared to where Stubbs was in the revenue wise. And, but we have been hit by the, the complexity of finding your efficiency in mm. manufacturing to get your margins where you want them to be is now coming to us. Yeah. Um, but it was not in the first five or six years. And right. if you're not making the margins you need, you don't have the money to invest in the sales and marketing. Capital burn yeah. is too much. And for the first three or four years, 
we didn't even realize there was anyone else making kale chips when we launched them. And then we find mm -hmm. out there was these really good companies, mm -hmm. Brad's Raw on the East Coast and uh, Alive and Radiant on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we're in like two or three regions of Whole Foods. And then we're like, oh. And you have competitors. Oh, well, yeah. Velocity was out of this world. Yeah. And then like six months later, there's two other brands on the same shelf now. And we have a third of the space. Mm -hmm. And the Velocity went down in half. And we're like, what is going on here? Yeah. My, my, my spreadsheets are not going to play out like I promised. Yeah, that's right. So we this battled. This is going to be a dicey board meeting. Yeah, yeah the, the mm -hmm. kale chip industry, if you will, yeah, yeah. was suddenly three players, uh, all well-funded. And you knew you couldn't put all of your eggs in the kale chip basket at that point, too. Correct. So it, which, which sort of forced your hand to, we need to diversify across a variety it of It did. Snacks. We had blinders on and fought yeah. the fight to hold on to our shelf space and expand to those stores that deserved a kale chip. Not yeah. everyone deserves it right. for whatever reason, if they're yeah. in an area where there's not as many people that are really into something yeah. super healthy. Right. Uh, You've got to find the consumers for those things. Yeah, yeah, once we hit the shelf, you know, the ACV or the percentage of stores that we felt mm -hmm. like, all right, growth is gonna start slowing mm -hmm. down, we poured everything we had into R&D. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's what we had to do. Like, right, that's new the vegetable, future of the new company. Fruit. What are we gonna do, develop this? All, you know, focus groups, right. uh, you know, empirical research, right. uh, scan through the IRI and Nielsen and SPINS data to see where there are holes in the marketplace. And we purposefully are like, okay, this is going to slow down. Mm -hmm. We may or may not win against our competitors. We're going to mm -hmm. still fight that fight right there. Right. But we have to be more than this. And we've had our blinders on for two or three years. Mm -hmm. This is more than just a kale chip company. This is, you know, a, an incredibly wonderful, you know, dense nutritional snack company that needs to expand into many, many more types of uh, right. of products. Right, because you saw, again, for projections and forecasts and things like that, you, you know, you go, okay, well, what can the domestic kale chip market be? And then what's our realistic market share of that, of that amount? Yeah. And there's the ceiling, right? And so, yeah. so then you look at it and you say, yeah, now let's take a step back and look at healthy snacking more broadly. It's a lot bigger pie. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And it, we, from day one, we knew we were there. Right. Keith had so many recipes that we wanted to look at. And well, and even then you called it Rhythm Superfoods. You didn't call it Rhythm Kale. Correct. Yeah. And right. we knew we were going to be more. We knew we wanted to have something healthy. And the, the term superfood, which is, it's also something that like we're kind of pulling back a little from because of the nature of how everyone is using that word. Yeah, and, it, gets, oh, it gets diluted <clears throat> uh, yeah. through, through overuse. Yeah. But uh, we took a ton of money kind of away from what you would say uh, street marketing and marketing in general, trade mm -hmm. spending. And over the last, well, for the last three years, the two years uh, mm -hmm. in the beginning of this three year period, a lot of dollars into R&D to right. develop the platform. We've got a whole pipeline now of things mm -hmm. that we're rolling two launches per year. Right. Um, some really innovative stuff that we'll be launching out next year. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all stuff like when we launch it, like who, right. who's going to be able to do it at scale? Only us. Because That's right, the, because you've done the, the legwork before yeah. before getting to that point. You built the platform, you built the manufacturing infrastructure. Now you have that kind of unfair advantage when you're like like rapid rapid cycle times. Through. Yes, yeah. exactly. So so <clears throat> what, are, what are other things that you... Uh, you know, like when you when you first started at at Rhythm and said, "I'm I'm going to take on this challenge," <clears throat> did you think it would be as hard as it's been? No, absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, seeing the ease with which we could ramp up production, mm -hmm. um, because all the ingredients for barbecue sauce are kind of like stable, you know, yeah, like they're sitting in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. You ask the co-packer, "Hey, you know, next month I think we're going to need." 40,000 cases is that at 20? Okay, we'll put an extra shift on. Yep. And that was the, I mean, I knew how to make it. I right. knew, I've spent been many, doing it for many days yeah, in yeah. the plant. Um, but it really, everything we made was simple to make. And the supply mm -hmm. chain of the ingredients were stable. Yeah. Um, even once we went, uh, you know, to purely natural mm -hmm. stuff. Um, the complexity of getting something fresh from the field, working with the farmers, like, if you if someone like you know Walmart or Whole mm -hmm. Foods or Costco or someone right. comes up to you and says, "I really love this beet chip. Yeah, I think we're going to put big displays in next month, and so I'm going to need twenty thousand. We're like, well, mm -hmm. our farmer only grows he did, X amount. You have to actually plant the things. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, a six month cycle before yeah. I can get any spike. Right. Above ten percent spike. Mm 
mm-hmm. without stealing from someone else. Right. Uh, and we don't do that. Yeah, because you've got you, you, there's the perishability, right? You've got the you, you've got the just the the cycle of produce and and allocating farmland to a particular crop versus something else. And mm-hmm. is this profitable enough for the farmer this year? And all the what, what the commodities pricing looks like and all yep. of that. And then you've got like on top of that, you know, the the challenges sometimes of producing weather. in a weather producing in a different country mm-hmm. having you know things getting held up at the at the border, border. or whatever you know, like timing and all of the th- there're just so many different variables that you now have to control for yeah and i think um it's the timing of the plantings um and and the weather mm-hmm. we spread growth with different farmers we've got four farmers we work with directly mm-hmm. that are within 150 miles from guadalajara mm-hmm. and they're all great usda organic certified farmers great processing stuff like they're selling produce to all the top 10 uh, retailers fresh right we're just buying it and processing it there um but once we have that geolocation kind of separated we're able to weather storms a little bit better so mm-hmm. if i have something that's closer to the west coast and a storm kind of blows in and we've got it growing at the same time somewhere else and we keep three or four weeks of inventory in the warehouse, we're kind of now at the point where we're able to weather little bumps and grinds. Right. Um, But in the end, you are right. Like when I say, hey, we just got Whole Foods National for this item. Someone has to put seeds into little trays inside a greenhouse and then, you know, three weeks later, take a tractor and put them inside a row and then turn on the the spigots of of the the, the lines of water. And then we wait and see if it's three months or it's four and a half months before they're ready to be harvested. And then there's a whole processing that takes place, getting it to the border, getting it in our warehouse, and then into our distributor's hands or retailer's hands. Mm -hmm. So it's a six-month process of someone saying yes. to, And then, like you said, the farmer's like, well, I don't know. I don't have enough land right now, but I've got cabbage coming out of this field in four right. weeks could you use so some i could of that? do it then you know <laughs> yeah. and i'll i'll turn yeah. the cabbage into beets that's mm-hmm. a good cross crop to put in there right right all of that all that complexity now one thing that i think is is pretty unusual and i've told you this before uh, about you is that a lot of ceos l- like to just kind of stay at this uh you know kind of the ethereal like stratosphere of strategy and that sort of thing and you really love the granular details, even as you were describing the, the the process of how the how the farmers work. Again, I know a lot of CEOs who, and I also know you actually go to the farms. Mm-hmm. You actually you you're in the plant. You're not like you're you're not like this head honcho guy who's like, no, I don't I I don't ever put on a hairnet or whatever yeah. the thing is, right? So you really love kind of geeking out on those those details and, and see it as a competitive advantage. How, like have you always been that way? Were you always kind of a uh like somebody who, who loves knowing the, the granular details about process? Yes. And you know, everyone's built different. Like yeah. my DNA is that person. And it's not a micromanaging thing. I'm just intellectually curious about how to do it. Yeah. And from spending time in the plants and the fields, I can talk about any, anything. With this company, Rhythm Superfoods, being so produce centric, right? I have to be able to talk. I go to a lot of sales presentations to our top 20 retailers. Mm-hmm. I love being there. I love hearing the feedback, trying to figure out how to solve problems that they're looking at. But <clears throat> when I tell them I can't do something for them for six, six months, um, mm-hmm. I know how to talk that talk. Like, you have to look at me. I'm a produce supplier. Right, I know right. We're, we're talking snack and better for you snack, but mm-hmm. I'm a produce supplier. But I would also say it's just you know part of my DNA. Mm-hmm. There, maybe that's not the right way to be, right? There's, no, there's other successful CEOs yeah. that yeah. like fly above that's right. the dirt and maybe... Uh-huh. They do better than I do because they're not <laughs> mired down into the into the. Well, it's a different gritty. style for sure, yeah. but 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 again, I think it also presents a number of different uh, opportunities for you as well because you're able to talk about the process and the product yeah. in a very different way. And with my sales team, mm-hmm. you know, I go down a lot more to the plants and the fields than they do, but we brought them all down. They all kind right. of know the process, but uh-huh. someone's got to be there as the expert. Mm-hmm. And I go along with them when they need the expertise, but I'm also teaching them as well. Right. Uh, for those that haven't gone down as as, as much as I have. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's <clears throat> that's unique. Now, is there there are things that you know we talked a little bit about? Yeah, it maybe wasn't as easy as you thought it was going to be starting out, but there are a number of things when you're a uh, 
a, a serial entrepreneur or a, a second, third, whatever time founder, you do have a series of, of advantages mm-hmm. over o, over a you know a first time founder, less experienced uh, yeah. entrepreneur. What are some of the ways that it has benefited you for rhythm to be kind of your second go round? Yeah, I've got specific stuff that I can think of right off the top of my yeah. head. For instance, <clears throat> um, brokers like. There are lots of brokers and there are national brokers. There's regional, local, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're small, you need brokers and until you even get to, to the huge billion dollar size, you're still using brokers. Yeah. And they represent your products and 20 to 50 other products in a region with professional salespeople that represent you either with you or even make presentations without you if you can't make it. And these are people who theoretically <clears throat> at least have very strong relationships at that headquarters level yeah. uh, with, They'll with the They'll live buyers. in that region yeah. where right. the headquarters of the yeah. retailer are. And so um, you can waste a lot of time with the mailbox brokers. like. They don't do a lot of work. They tell you they're going to do a lot of work, but they yep. check the mailbox every day to make the, sure the check is there. That's right. And, yeah. and you know, if you're small, you don't even know the nuance of the friction of, hey, I have to do so much work for you before mm-hmm. I even start getting a few hundred dollars a month. That's right. Um, and they're wanting to charge you 2500 a month as a retainer. And, and you got to... 5% <clears throat> and all the things, and yeah. You, mm-hmm. you may not know how to negotiate and say, look, you know, I don't want to pay you anything until three months after the category reviews. When mm-hmm. are the category reviews? Why would I want to pay you something now right. if the buyer's not going to see me for six months from now, right? That's right. So That's right. those kind of things. Understanding that, how that works. Yeah, because yeah. if you don't know those things, the relationship gets off to a bad start anywhere. Yeah. You're like, hey, I've been paying this guy for five months and nothing's happened. Yeah. Well, you didn't even know to ask that, like, mm-hmm. when was the category review? Like, right. Whole Foods only sees this category one time a year. Right. You started paying them a retainer eight months before that was going to happen. Yeah, they don't even have an, an right. appointment for a mm-hmm. while. Yeah. So uh-huh. there's things like that, the contracts with your distributors and mm-hmm. retailers, that there are certain things in there that you have to really understand whether you're going to agree to do it or not mm-hmm. agree to do it. Right. Um, how to present yourself with uh, supply chain. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of people that when they first start out, they're like buying bags from Uline and right. having a sticker, or Costco or sticker wherever. Yeah. printed. Uh-huh. And you look at them, you go, how much is this bag costing? And you're like, oh, the bag's only like you know 11 cents. I'm like, oh, well, that's great. Well, the sticker's 22 cents. So they're like, oh, right. wow, that's 33 cents a bag. Uh-huh. If you just committed $8,000 up front, you'll pay eight cents a bag for color process printing right. with artwork that's beautiful. So there's things that's like right. that on the supply chain side, um, freight and who you're dealing with as a right. freight carrier, uh, whether you're gonna negotiate slotting allowances with this mm-hmm. retailer versus another retailer. Right. Second yeah. time around, I'm able to help that way in a big way. Right, because you've been burned. You, yeah. <laughs> a lot yeah. of times you're like, you've, you've learned some lessons the hard way. And and you and, and again, because you're a curious, intellectually curious person, you say, why is it, why does it have to be that way? Or why why is this agreement written that way? Or, you know, some of the, the DSD uh, uh, contracts can Ooh, be very aggressive. On the beverage side. Yeah, on the beverage in particular. But but a lot of the DSD contracts in general can be fairly aggressive. And so, uh, and you, like, do I have to do I have to play ball this way? Is this is this the only path? I yeah. don't know. I yeah. think a certain amount is like uh, when you're first starting out to, if it's your first time, you're just dying to get yeses. And so you're smiling and saying yes to everything. Yeah. And what you don't realize is you've just been backed up into a corner that will put you out of business. Mm-hmm. Y- you said yes to a 7% broker commission mm-hmm. instead of negotiating the norm of five down to four early on. Right. And instead of a $2,500 a month retainer, it's we'll, we'll do a thousand once you get your first purchase order from a mate. Like there's things that you have to do and the broker may not even see the vision of like no. they're putting you out of business or the distributor doesn't. Yeah. You don't even know, but you've said yes so many times because you're just dying for a yes right. from the retailer or right. whoever. That suddenly you you're not making anything, you're losing a lot of money. And then absolutely, it's hard to get it back. Absolutely. And I, I see this a lot with people who like really small brands who and they're and they're ecstatic. They think, I just got into Walmart. I just got into Kroger National or things like that. Yeah. And, and 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 they think they made it. Yeah. And I go 
you oh. may have just ruined your company there. Yeah. It, are, are you ready for this, buddy? Like, are, like, do you know what you just signed up for? Not that you don't want to be in those accounts because they sell a lot of groceries, yeah. but you need to understand the sequencing. You need to understand, am I going am, am I going to be able to support that account? Am I going to be able to Can afford? Can you ship on time? Yeah, because if you don't, you're done, yeah. right? And so all the, <laughs> all the nuance, it's actually better to practice on some smaller accounts initially if you mm -hmm. don't have if you don't have the reps right yeah, the retailers over the years i think back when when we first started um the data has become much more robust mm -hmm. and the retailers know their data more than anyone else does yeah and so they know that they should be optimizing their space to a certain amount of revenue and margin and like if you can't ship them They've said yes to Kroger says yeah 800 stores or yeah. Walmart or you know National with Whole Foods whoever the retailer is mm -hmm. and you're like you just say yes because it this is what is going to tell Uncle Jimmy that he's going to invest 250 thousand into right. you and you, that's all going to fold together into getting more capacity but but you don't realize like you don't have it to get that amount of product ready in time it's ruthless to do that and trust me us yeah. relying on fresh produce from the field and storms and icings and stuff i've had to have the I mean, in the last two years i've had mm -hmm. way more than my conversations i want to have right. so is our team saying like we're really sorry but we're not going to ship you on time and yeah their immediate reaction and you get is, you get yelled at sometimes yeah and they're like <laughs> i can't have you have that space open so i'm gonna have to give it to someone else that's right um, tell the truth early, as soon as you know it, that yeah. you're not, and and ho hopefully you can hold on to, to, to retailers, distributors, <clears throat> and investors. Yep. Yeah. So even if things aren't going well, uh, your investors are going to find out eventually. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's probably a good idea for you to just go ahead and say, here's what's happening, and here's my plan to get out of it. Yeah. Right? So what, what other uh, kind of common, I know you spend a lot of time and you're very generous with your time uh, with a, a lot of startup founders here in Austin and certainly uh, beyond uh, Central Texas and across the country. Um, what, are, what are some of the kind of uh, other go-to pieces of advice that you find that you're often giving to these kind of early stage founders? Like where should they be focusing their time and attention? Yeah, you know, there's, there's all kinds of little colloquialisms that seem generic, um, you know, go where your passion is or, you know, things like that. But they kind of, they spring back up at various points because they're true. Yeah. 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 I would say one of the most, I deal with this because we've had the mistakes mm. along the way. Like when I, when we first started with Stubbs, like mm -hmm. the sauce was so delicious. It sold itself. We knew it. The products we then came out with afterwards uh, Chef Paul Prudhomme helped us develop the beef and the chicken and the pork marinade. Yeah. And we worked weeks and weeks in their test kitchens with it. It was delicious. And so having something inside the package that's truly delicious is number one. Yeah. <clears throat> because you can always fix the package, you can always yeah. fix all this other stuff. But if it, you can be the best marketer in the world and you can sell it one time, but if what's in that package is kind of gross yeah. or, or just regular, it doesn't matter. It's hard to get Take people it from someone that's time. making kale chips. Yeah, yeah. Kale in and of itself, <laughs> I don't know how you make it. I mean, it's in salads and you put a vinegar-based right. something. mixed under a lot of you things. You put it in yeah. soup and, uh -huh. and, and, yeah. and, and put it in smoothies, but mm -hmm. you're not drinking a kale smoothie. It's just kale smoothie. Right. There's going to be some cashew butter and some fruits and bananas or chocolate that's or right, whatever. Yeah. And kale is difficult to make taste good. Yeah. So we spent, I think, an inordinate amount of time on the recipes to say, all right, the nutrition on this thing is a powerhouse, mm -hmm. but if you just dry it by itself... Ugh, it's a little bit tough to swallow, right? That's so right. even the hardcore very small market for that. Yeah. yeah. So even on our quote unquote original, which uh -huh. is a plain kind of a right, we would call it sea salt. There's you know sunflower seed and lemon juice and salt and pepper and Trying garlic to and ever accentuate the the notes yeah, of the you've kale. You've got yeah. to. Mm -hmm. I mean, or you know, yeah. the family that it's from, which is uh -huh. like cabbage and Brussels sprouts, when mm -hmm. broccoli. You know, when mom's making broccoli in the house because the sulfur yeah. inside that family of vegetables mm -hmm. expresses itself right same thing with kale uh -huh. so the product the product is super important you hear it over and over mm -hmm. and over again so i would say that's number one mm -hmm. i think number two uh, almost as equal to it <clears throat> is know how the category of where you're going to be um is already played like if you say i'm going to be this 
energy bar, just mm-hmm. to use a different category. Right. You better spend a whole lot of time at the natural and the mm-hmm. conventional channel, sitting in stores. Mm-hmm. Every retailer looks at it differently. Right. And take pictures and look mm-hmm. at it, see what the price is, price per ounce. Um, who's it, like, I would say the category of energy bars is one of the most incredible categories. It's, it's billions and billions of dollars at yeah. retail. And you think it's that very there's crowded. no more that mm-hmm. can happen, mm-hmm. but then someone, uh, an RX bar comes out of That's nowhere right. and actually did okay mm-hmm. in the first mm-hmm. couple of years. And then packaging they changed and how the packaging. it expressed itself, mm-hmm. uh, changed it. And they had hardcore people that mm-hmm. I, I guess were box gym kind of folks or right. whatever that were looking for a certain type mm-hmm. of protein. But yeah. like, you can't just go in there and say like, if there's four other energy bars that are targeting, um, women who were born on Tuesday. <laughs> right, right, then right. all yeah. you're going to do is get a slice of the women that were born on Tuesday, right? Mm-hmm. But if it's like, if there's no one doing women born on Thursdays, yeah. then then that's the segment that, that a buyer is going to sit there and go, you know what? I don't have any for women born on Thursday. That's right, yeah. I'm going to find the space for you. So. Right, because that buyer mm-hmm. understands that in their store that the women born on Thursday are coming in and out of the store not buying anything. And that buyer, it's in that buyer's interest to address the needs and problems it's of It's additive that to their revenue of right. their set. Yeah. And if you're just the fourth one that comes for women mm-hmm. born on Tuesday, mm-hmm. you better you're really have some the other data three. that yeah. says you're going to double the category because your stuff is so great. Right. Or he's just given more space but isn't going to grow the category. So that's the mindset that they do. That's right. And time in that category. That category. Yeah, you got to understand the table stakes. You got to understand the. I, I think it's important to understand the incentives mm-hmm. for the the people who are managing those categories. Again, like if 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 you do well in a category and your margins are for the retailer are worse than everybody else, then they're not incentivized to give you more facings right. because you're you're actually like you're dragging down. One of the key metrics that their their bonus is probably calculated very based much upon. tied to it. It's, yeah. it's revenue yeah. growth right. and margin. Right, and so margin to them is profit. Yeah, and so if if there's a buyer that has a twelve foot section of energy bars, right, mm-hmm. every single SKU is in their software program where mm-hmm. they can see with a, with a couple of clicks of the button, mm-hmm. like which one is dragging, right, and not. I get thirty three point six percent here. I get thirty seven point nine percent. What's there. my total yeah. penny profit that I'm making on a yeah. weekly basis? Dollars and units. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. So they're looking at that, and so you come in and you go, "I've looked at your category." Like you do this before you go see a buyer for your mm-hmm. presentation because you're going in, you're saying like, "Right, hey, you've got three bars." for women that were born on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing some white space is the term people talk about. Right, like, right. Where's this open white space that hasn't been filled? Right. And that's that's an area that I would mm-hmm. say, um, I'll give you another mm-hmm. an, another yeah. example of it. Can't remember the brand, you, you'll probably remember it, but it was just told to me mm-hmm. last year. If you go to the cake decorating, cake and cupcake decorating mm-hmm. set, there's, mm-hmm. I think there's a licensed uh, Betty Crocker, and you can write happy birthday right. with a little squeegee, you know, can, right. mm-hmm. and there's sprinkles and nonpareils and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And right. it's pretty much like nuclear colors and, and sugar, right? right? Mm-hmm. And so that's yeah. the category. Then Ar- a lot of artificial colors and flavors. Someone did a, an organic version of it or an mm-hmm. all natural version of mm-hmm. it. And like, mm-hmm. who's not going to give them, you know, six skews in that space? Because they probably at have, least to try it. Yeah, four, yeah, they have four facings of of mm-hmm. of, uh, of or two facings of four different colors, eight different colors of the same can. Right. So I'm just going to scoot this over and give this new all natural organic right. one. So right. that's another area. Like understand like how you're getting your space and how the category manager buyers. Where are those buyers. sleepy categories, <clears throat> the sleepy sets that there's you know that there's no difference between a, a natural and conventional grocery store and and the natural people kind of feel ashamed about it yeah Yeah. before you go and raise and and, uh, do all your credit cards and and Mm -hmm. mortgage your house to do it yeah know where it's going to be in a store right know that there's a person in the office that tracks all that Mm -hmm. and and identify yourself even go in there put your little photographic things in the space and go does it fit here does it Mm -hmm. look there so how am i going to compete with all these other things. There's the price. Mm-hmm. Make a matrix of your spreadsheet, like get the mm-hmm. you know Excel sheet yeah. out with a photo of yours and every other brand in there. What's their call outs of mm-hmm. their, what makes their brand specialty? What's the price? 
price per ounce? What is the ounce of the item of, of mm-hmm. what's a standardized can or bag or box? And see where you fit in. So right, that, because if, you're, if, if your thing is, uh, if your bottle of whatever is twi- twice, yeah. twice as tall as everybody else's, you may think, oh, that's so cool, and then it actually doesn't fit on the shelf. Yeah, yeah. so you really yeah. got to envision down to the nuts and bolts, sitting in the store saying, I'm going to have to see this person who I don't know mm-hmm. yet, know that they're motivated by growth and revenue and growth and margin. Mm-hmm. And what do I do to bring them something that's going to achieve? That's it. You yeah. got to achieve those goals. Right. Yeah. And that's uh, fundamentally, you know, I like to think of that, uh, that grocery store, that category manager, buyer, they are a, they're a landlord and uh, the brands are tenants, but they're revenue producing tenants. Yeah. And so they're yeah. they're swapping out revenue producing tenants all the time. And they're saying, if you want to make, it, you want me to put your thing on the shelf, I've got to take something else off. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to convince me that I, as the landlord, am going to make mm-hmm. more money by having you on the shelf rather than that other thing. Yeah. And they'll oftentimes charge you for that. Right. To yeah. get on. They de-risk it yeah. for themselves. Right. And that's, again, one of those kind of dirty little secrets as you as you dig into the the industry that there are certain, you know, there's some retailers who actually are making more profit uh, from from their slotting fees than from actually selling groceries. Yeah. There, there's yeah. a lot of churners out yeah. there. Uh-huh. Uh, I, you know, you just have to prepare yourself in those costs. Like mm-hmm. if you're moving product out of their category and mm-hmm. it's, the velocities are good, they'll never get rid of you because they're going to make money. But they're going to review, the category review right. on an annual basis mm-hmm. is there to like slough off that's you know, right. the, the bird that isn't going to make it out of the nest. That's right. And that's why you want to mm-hmm. ask. And I think you should be really upfront with your with your buyer and say, what are your expectations? What mm-hmm. What is... Uh, you know what? What is good enough? What mm-hmm. you know? What? How am I indexing along with the category? What will blow your mind if I actually can achieve this sort of velocity? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. it's a mis- mistake not to ask it because yeah. they have that information. They do, and nine out of ten of them will share it with you. They will, yeah. And you know, again, the one out of ten, at least you ask. Yeah, and the right? one out of ten yeah. might be just like, well, I don't want to tell him all my secrets because he, uh-huh. he actually may achieve right around here, but yeah. I make more slotting next year from this new item. I'm going to come out. He's going to come back and tell me what I told them a year ago. So right. yeah. just but you try. Hold their cards. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. So so that's really uh really insightful. Are you so like what are you excited about? I know you you mentioned you've got some some new product innovations kind of coming down the down the pike. What 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 makes you spring out of bed uh, at, at this point uh, in 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 your life uh, yeah. about um, you know kind of where where rhythm superfoods is going and maybe even uh, broadly like where where what you see like natural foods is going. Rhythm uh, will have its biggest growth year this year than it's ever had in the following year too. Part of that has been a lot of careful planning and you put the financing. foundation in place. And new plant capacity that's just mm-hmm. coming online mm-hmm. uh, on things that we are have not been able to sell as much last year. Yeah. So that in and of itself, with some really good products that we're just launching right now. Yeah. We already had kind of like it's in the bag. We've got it. So I'm really yeah. pleased about that. So that that should... and that's pretty normal. Like for people, I'm sure mm-hmm. you'll 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 debut some things at, at Natural Products Expo West, and that that tends to be. Uh, a big launch moment for yeah. for people. Yeah, yeah we will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and I would say that the the industry in, in a whole, it will follow the economic cycles. I just mm-hmm. remember after that 2008 crash, mm-hmm. like the expos and the fancy food shows, um, were like, you know, financially I'm sure they were okay, but it was like half full. Yeah, because a lot of people couldn't travel get the financing and mm-hmm. and this and that and like. Uh, retailers weren't taking risks and they were trying to reduce labor and yeah. people weren't shopping as much or whatever they're going to do. So like economic cycles are uncontrolled. I can't control that. Mm-hmm. So if economic cycles happen, then you'll see a lot you just less try to respond. risk yeah. takers out there coming up with the new best collagen powder or bone broth or whatever the newest thing is. Right. <clears throat> but short of that, I would say one of the things that's so surprising to me um, compared to when we first started the Stubbs Barbecue Sauce Company, there wasn't any competition. If there was, there was one, right? Um, right. And, and then it took another three years for another one, and they were a regional one and starting to do what we did at a later mm-hmm. date. But, like, if I remember seeing the first, like, bona fide bone broth um, had it at um, our broker's, uh, the owner of our broker's uh-huh. house, and it was a frozen version of it, if I remember uh-huh. correctly. And uh-huh. I'm like, yeah. that's great. This is awesome. What is this good? Oh, it's yeah. you know, good for joint and, uh-huh. yeah. and your skin and all that kind of stuff. And I'm a believer, you know, because sure. yeah. he's 
telling me. And and so at the next trade show, I saw them. Right. And then like so that was like what I saw as the launch of of a bone broth segment. Right. And then like the next trade show, really smart, financed, creative people had mm-hmm. already figured out, and I was like, mm. and then like Kettle and Fire, and mm-hmm. then this this brand, and then Epic. There's several and of them. So uh-huh. like the speed with which an idea mm-hmm. not only launches but soon after has competitors. If we had an idea right now for a product, if we don't yeah. jump on it and do it, I'm certain that someone in a garage in San Mateo is thinking the same thing. They're working on it. Because there probably is. Yeah. So that to me is like, you could come to these trade shows 15 years ago mm-hmm. and you would be something. If you had a unique item, yeah, yeah. you could just have soup in a jar and you're right. the only soup in a jar, right? Yeah. But nowadays it's like when you show up and you've got something new and it's got the slight, slightest uh, velocity story going on. Because people are, they're paying attention <clears throat> to that data. Correct. Yeah. And the da- data is robust. Yeah. There are, there are, every broker has uh-huh. all the data. Uh-huh. Half the private equity guys have all the data. Right. And they're scouring it and have people that are looking to see what the new small little nugget is that mm-hmm. let's go talk to them and see if we can finance them. Right. And if we can't finance them, is there someone else that can do a little pivot over here that's in mm-hmm. our team that could be a fast follower? You know, that's right. Like, it's super fast right now. And right. I'm saying like the creativity and the financing of it. Is massive. So you've got to. So so that kind of uh, reinforces how like the execution risk. You've you've got yeah. to say you can't just be like you can't have a good idea and say oh look or I have a good idea. It's it's uh, can you can you uh, come up with an idea? Can you execute that initial kind of prototype? Can you get it to market and can you scale that and yeah. support it well? And you if if you stumble at any point along the way, you know there will be. You know, at least a handful, maybe dozens of other competitors mm-hmm. who, like, once that becomes a deal, you know, we saw it with cold brew coffee or, or you know, any number of gluten-free yeah. baking mixes, yeah. right? You know, one one year there's one gluten-free baking mix, the next year there's two dozen of them, or, you know, or whatever the thing is, and so that's how fast it happens. Yeah, 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 it's really, really quick, and so yeah, you have to, you know, if you're sitting on an idea like, and you think this is the time, you should really kind of get after it. I would say also, um, it's a, it's a shot across the bow to those people that have been in an industry for a long time, and maybe the brand hasn't been refreshed, mm-hmm. and like. I don't want to call out one versus another, but you you could it's like stagnated. Yeah, yeah, I could even say like coffee shops, yeah. Starbucks. You know, yeah. totally turned everyone upside down. Right, right? and and coffee yeah. in the store was like Styrofoam Folgers cups. and and yeah. <laughs> and was it Taster's Choice and, and Maxwell Max, House? Maxwell House. Uh-huh. And then all of a sudden, every retailer had roasted beans with a grinder, right? Uh-huh. And That's then right. that was messy. You don't see the grinders anymore except yeah. at Costco. Uh-huh. What you do is see these exceptional bags of, of uh-huh. stuff that the was gusseted, just made uh, two or three yeah. weeks ago with a little gas valve. Yeah. So, and nobody, you know, there's very few cans. It used to only yeah. be cans. So yeah. no no one's safe. And, mm-hmm. and if someone is out there and they're a barbecue sauce company, mm-hmm. I don't know if an eight, you know, HPP fresh barbecue sauce has 25% more unique and better flavor than if it was pasteurized. Right. But I'm just making that up. Yeah, but yeah. Like, uh-huh. uh, even, not even if you've got a brand new idea, but if you're just sitting on, on your chair and reading the Wall Street Journal every morning and you're running a food company and your, right. your sales are stagnant, yeah. someone is thinking about disruption in some way somewhere and they will right. figure it out. So you think like uh, like in your in your estimation, you know, because for a lot of the brands who are starting off, their their big dream or big goal is to be acquired by one of those one of those people who's reading the Wall Street Journal in yeah. their in their easy chair. Is that uh, is that a forever and ever uh, trend, or is it a is it a moment in time uh, where where that happens more, where where these big big food or big CPG companies are more uh, acquisitive? You know, they go through cycles too. It's, I don't know if it's a Wall Street driven cycle mm-hmm. or not, but the reason we have so many private equity investment bankers walking the trade shows now mm-hmm. is because <clears throat> there was a moment in time where all the big CPG companies were stagnant. Yeah. And, and little entrepreneurial companies were nipping at their heels and coming out with cereals and mm-hmm. yogurts and other things. And they weren't big, but suddenly people were getting bigger and they 
all they were in a combined was, way they were they they were yeah really taking a significant and chunk innovation of market share. at the large companies was a new flavor of something right right yeah. and so or they got of, taste news yeah yeah. Uh-huh. yeah so I think like when when I think about that in the last ten years there's mm-hmm. been a lot of of acquisitions from the major C- CPG strategic companies um, and that's brought in a lot of money to to get entrepreneurs to build things fast right um, but. I think there's a little shift that happens now too, and it's it's not as easy for a big company to buy a twenty five million dollar company and mm-hmm. integrate it successfully, right. so that the accretion that they thought they were going to get on earnings or whatever is actually there, and it's so, meaningful to but them. But there's not yeah. a lot of companies in the hundred million to billion dollar range that right. are there to be acquired. That's right. So they're they're all trying to figure out how to create value for their shareholders. So I would say that. It, you know, uniqueness of of VMG buying mm-hmm. pop chips and creating Doing the snack brands, the snack yeah, platform. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the long term is, but maybe it's an IPO for all I know. Versus mm-hmm. what a private equity company has done traditionally is invest, get them ready for growth, sell it off. Right. I don't know. Maybe right. this is IPO. Maybe it's different. It's true. But there also could be a shift happening right now where the family business because the CPGs are going to go in a different direction. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a moment in time right now that this this uh, lifestyle company that you create can grow faster because the CPG guys are now waiting to invest their capital until you get to that two or $300 million range. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. And if you, if you run the business right and you can run it profitably at some point, then you have some of those options hard available to Hard to predict it. Yeah. And so I would Probably, yeah. you know, not want to predict oh, it. It's sure. changing yeah. so often. Well, and, and, and I think, but you bring up a good point, which is really to be, uh, you know, sort of to be a, a, a good target for one of those big, those large strategic acquirers. Typically, you're going to be at, I would say, at a, at a minimum of like maybe $25 million in revenue, may, maybe north of that, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the only companies that are getting bought below that, that line are typically going to be bought by a private equity firm that's that maybe is doing kind of a roll up strategy and they're saying I'm going to buy you know six of these small cold brew coffee companies and maybe kind of combine them in some yeah. way right and there there may be the unique one that is smaller than that that someone really big buys but I think behind the curtain there's some very very specific reason why and right. you don't know for another year or two why right. but there's a strategy behind it they don't just do things willy nilly at right. all right but, well in the in the savvy ones realize that they're their 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 organization is so so vast that they're sort of like an elephant that can accidentally sit on this tiny yeah. little brand. If you're not big enough, you're you, they'll accidentally kill you. Yeah, right? like yeah. you go in there and who's going to manage it? Someone has to manage it. If they buy it, you may hang on, but mm-hmm. they know that once you've got a lot of money, right. you're going to start thinking about you know that boat that you wanted to buy or mm-hmm. take more vacations or spend time with the kids or whatever. Yeah, and so someone in that headquarters. Uh, in Battle Creek or you know Minneapolis or whatever has to like go. All right, so I was just on Cheerios or I was on mm-hmm. Frosted Flakes and and now for the next two years I'm going to this brand that no one knows with a budget of like this. Yeah, so it's, it's there's a there's yeah. And, and what is big to you as a as an entrepreneur? You know, you're like, oh, we're doing five million dollars a year in revenue. Right. It's like, man, that's a the rounding error of a rounding right. error. Yeah. So I think though that the the metrics that matter, no matter what the cycle is, mm-hmm. <clears throat> is hard to do this in the very beginning, but yeah. getting healthy margins eventually or a path to healthy margins. Yeah. Because a path to healthy margins that you can prove out will either bring investment or bring acquisition right. or profitability. Right. And as long as you can get an As item, long as you are being uh, sensibly frugal as you, as you grow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's uh-huh. a magic thing, I think, like that... There's a little bit of luck, I, I you know, because we can't do it every time we try to develop mm-hmm. a product. But like, the magic bullseye is I got to develop a product that's unique and speaks to a certain consumer that wants to buy it often. Right. I need to do it at a price that gives me the margin that I need to start with to be profitable. And does that price that I sell it for? achieve what the consumer is expecting. Mm-hmm. And usually those are hay- haywire in the very beginning. Right. It's really hard. So you're taking yeah. it on the chin yeah. on margin unless there's this kind of unicorn thing that co- comes together and you're like, wow, right. the consumers are willing to pay this price. Yeah. And yes, we know that if we want to broaden it to a broader base, I've got to drive some cost out of it. Mm-hmm. But it's really magical when you find that item that the development of that product has come in at the price that a consumer set 
is willing to pay the price to give you a, a margin to be sustainable. Right. Yeah, I like to say that you're <clears throat> you're really trying to model your 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 pricing and costing both uh, bottom up and top down. Like yeah. where where do you need to be in the bell curve of your category? Like where in most startup brands you know, I, it, it, as you know, you well know, it's it's a lot easier to bring your 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 price down than up, mm -hmm. and uh, and it is really uh, it, most of the time you're going to be a premium product, and it's okay. Yeah, it really is okay, yep. and you feel you you're not you're not you shouldn't be in a position where you're competing. Uh, you know, you, your your per ounce price is uh, the same as Kellogg's. Right, like you're going to lose that every time. Yeah, we all promise. The scale you. that they yeah. manufacture at is yeah. incredible. Yeah. Stubbs was the same way as we are right now where we've uh -huh. got the most expensive uh snacks on the shelf really on a yeah. per ounce basis uh we know that if we, we could, have very light stuff yeah. too yeah but if we yeah. could bring it down to an extruded snack price we would have more but the, the margins aren't there right stuff right. was the same with stubbs barbecue sauce was like 399 to 349 and that 349 and 399 and we ended up through scale you know, contracting for millions of pounds of tomato paste eventually, right? And making sixteen thousand cases a day that provides tremendous cost uh, reduction. But it really was like the most expensive barbecue sauce on the shelf. And every buyer we we talked to was like, "There's no way this stuff is going to sell." The pressure from them into their right. belief system is, "No one will pay this money for that." And right. We had to. It's gonna. Here's the dad. I swear they're right. gonna buy it. Right. Well, it may work in Texas, but it's not gonna work here. Right. And. It worked and it worked and it worked and yeah, we weren't we, number we, we one. We certainly experienced that at Siete too, right? Yeah, you know, with the like price of, really expensive. You know, like yeah. nobody's going to buy that. Just give mm -hmm. us a shot. Yeah, they probably will. Yeah. And and yeah, and that's one of the things. Like if you can find something that when the pricing you come out with it gives you the margin to immediately be like, all right, we're going to be safe from day one. Yeah, that's like a miracle. Then yeah, then you can like take yeah. a breath and you go. Now I'm not operating out of a scarcity mentality all the time yeah. where it's like it's desperation, yeah. desperation yeah. all the time and, and always hustling and always do you know, all, all that stuff. It's like, no, what what do we want to be? What is this brand all yeah. about? What do we stand Thinking for? Thinking about much smarter things. That's right. Yeah, all of that stuff. Well, this has been really a, a, a delightful conversation as I as I knew it would be. So yeah. thank you, Scott. Uh, again, really fun to just uh, dive deep. I know, uh, I'm, I'm sure that our listeners are, uh, you know, probably, hopefully they, they're going to like hit pause, go back to the beginning and say, oh, I need to actually get my pen and paper out now. We, we need to take some notes uh, because there's just so many nuggets of, of wisdom in here that I know are uh, tremendously useful. So thank you for sharing today. I know you do this. Uh, you're very generous with your time and wisdom uh, with lots of founders. So uh, thanks for sharing that that with us today. Really enjoyed it too, Ben. Really appreciate being asked to be here. And I love spreading whatever I know. We didn't have that when we started Stubb. So there's, there's a pay it forward mentality from uh, myself and any of the partners that we had at Stubbs. Like we just love helping people. Meanwhile, you got a day job to go try to sell more That's right. chips. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have to balance all those yeah. things. You can't take all the coffees, but it's, uh, it, it is fun to create, uh, you know, again, some of these advantages for, for founders. And, you know, uh, I, I feel like in Austin, there's a, there's a, a generous spirit, uh, among a lot of the, particularly the, the food and beverage CPG entrepreneurs and, uh, who, who are willing to share some of those hard, hard won lessons. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, that makes, hopefully that means that the next generation of, of, of founders will be even smarter and more successful. Yeah, and that build the infrastructure great. here for Austin as, as yeah. this food epicenter. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're, you're part uh, of the infrastructure, yeah. Ben. Well, as, as are you. So again, uh, to our, our, our listeners, uh, and, and viewers, thank you guys so much for, for listening. If you're getting a lot out of this, please share it with your friends, uh, colleagues, uh, people who you know are with you in the trenches and and really trying to build something special and something innovative and remarkable. And uh, you can always go to barcodestartup.com and uh, listen to more episodes, uh, read transcripts in full, find more resources. And really our, our focus is on equipping emerging consumer brands. So hopefully the content that we're, we're sharing and the conversations uh, really make you think differently about your business. So again, uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening and watching.